Welcome to the Bloodborne bosses ranked by law. This video was a huge effort as contextualizing the Bloodborne universe in one video while ranking the enemies is no easy feat. Thankfully for me though, I've had some great help, especially from the last protagonist. Although the ranking is purely my opinion, he really helped me understand the lore in a way no one else was. So if you have the time after this video, check out his channel in the description. Included in the video are all unique Chalice Dungeon bosses and every boss encounter in the main game and DLC. The Man-Eater Boar, Brain Sucker and Loran Silver Beast have been excluded from the list due to their regular appearance as normal enemies and having no distinct features in their boss variant. Without further ado, let's get into the first ranking. For our first entry on this list, we are starting with a being that in many ways exists in a realm that encapsulates the beginning of the timeline of the game, the Thumerian civilization. The Merciless Watchers share a stature not too dissimilar to the Thumerians themselves, so surely their credentials as Thumerians would put them much higher on this list. However, it's clear even the Thumerians were not averse to a class-based society. It's likely the Merciless Watchers, although ambiguous in their race, as there is no certainty of their Thumerians, Thumerian heritage, were the slave race used by the Thumerians to carry out less palatable tasks of their society. Thumerians, of course, are the near primordial beings found deep in the old civilizations buried in the labyrinths uncovered by the Bergenworth prospectors. We, of course, will delve further into more about the Thumerians as the list goes on, but what we need to know here is that the Watchers were their labor fodder, likely imprisoned to a lifetime of duty deforming them or being deformed from birth and left to act as brutes in the depths of their society. We learn that more elaborate Thumerians often utilize fire in their repertoire. Their proficiency with fire underpinned their expertise and mastery over combat. The Watchers, however, had no such talent, further solidifying their less than Thumerian credentials. With crude weaponry and a lack of insight that exemplify the power of the Thumerians, the Merciless Watchers, although greater than many regular enemies, are the lowest ranking boss on this list. The next entry underpins once again a similar ethos to the Merciless Watchers. The undead giants, in my view, are closer to the Thumerians than the Watchers, however. Although they too do not possess the affinity and mastery over fire, they are aesthetically much more similar to the Thumerians. Sharing stature and aesthetics, it's likely the undead giants were once Thumerians, either of a lower class or more likely imprisoned and penalized for crimes now since forgotten. It's clear they're not natural in their physique. Most of the undead giant bosses we encounter have had clear experimentation over their bodies, some with cannon sewn into their skin, others with chains and cutlasses. What is clear is that the Thumerians were not above the vices of humanity and they too indulged in penalties and slave work. The undead giant were once Thumerians, but mutilation would push them further into their more tortured appearance. It's likely once experimented on, they would be left to fulfill a similar role as the Merciless Watchers, labor fodder to carry out the least palatable duties of the society. A crude evidence of this is how many undead giants have candles perched on their backs, as if their existence were manually reduced to human torches for the civilization. When compared to the Watchers, we see more aspects of the Thumerian race in the Undead Giants. From their movement, to their ability to be almost eloquent in using their chains, weaponry, and even cannons attached to their bodies, it's more likely they held a closer affiliation to the Thumerians, and it's the reason why they're here on the list. From crude strength to heightened intelligence, the Witches of Hemwick are residents of the cemetery neighbouring the School of Mensis. The School of Mensis was an offshoot organisation from the Healing Church but with roots closer to the original Bergenworth institution. Rather than the Healing Church, it would be the lasting Bergenworth traditions that would underpin the aesthetics of the School of Mensis. The School of Mensis would derive great influence by building an institution that utilised kidnapping for research. This influence would rival the other two major branches of the Healing Church, such as the Church itself and the growing power of the choir. 
Mensis were specifically brutal with the way they conducted research. We learn from the environment and item descriptions that the school maintained a destructive path with their ultimate goal to commune and even summon a great one. It's unclear what kind of experiments Mensis indulged in, but it's clear to take heavy precedent from the work of Master Willem. His concept of internal eyes, Rom's ascension and cause. Mensis was able to build a steady pipeline of victims through their dominance over Yahagul, specifically the Hemmekshanal Lane and the old crematorium of Yarnum. The Crowfeather Garb tells us that many dead were sent to Hemwick as a burial service, likely unknowing that their bodies were being first sent to Mensis for experimentation. But many too would find themselves lost in the twisted woods and waiting for them were the witches of Hemwick, ready to capture another more fresh victim for the school of Mensis. The Witches of Hemwick were likely affiliated with the School of Mensis, as they are covered in eyes, a tradition brought forward from the later Bergenworth by Mensis. There is little to really say about the distinctive nature of the Witches of Hemwick, outside the fact that we encounter two of them in our battle. As they are covered in eyes, it's likely the Witches have enjoyed a long and successful tenure. Credit to their ability to continue capturing the unfortunate who would wind up in Hemwick. When assessing their strength, we have to build a case around their very limited arsenal. It's clear the witches have benefited deeply from the engraving of eyes into their own body, manifesting spells attuned to those with higher levels of insight. Insight itself is a prime indicator for strength in Bloodborne. The witches are able to make great use of their own insight in our battle against them, using it to cloak themselves from our own perception, but more notably the ability to manifest mad ones to battle you. A technique seldom seen anywhere else in the game. However, the witches themselves are small and frail, and it's clear they rely heavily on surprising victims and using the foliage of Hemwick to win battles. It is for this reason the witches of Hemwick rank here on the list. The story of the Bloodstarved Beast is the story of the Ashen Blood Plague and Yarnum's first major descent into the old blood of the Healing Church, and likely the moment the Healing Church would become a primary governing body in Yarnum. The Ashen Blood was a separate ailment to the Old Blood that was proliferated by a disease of mysterious origin. Although it's unclear where the disease came from, it's widely assumed that the disease was waterborne and may have even been leveraged by the founders of the Healing Church to cause the people of Yarnum to turn to the Old Blood as a means of survival. The disease being inevitably fatal to regular human blood would push the Old Yarnumites to blood ministration, and it's likely this would be the precursor for the scourge of the beast that would take a hold of Old Yarnum. Amongst the first to be infected were the Old Yarnumites, who would, in many senses, become the first to truly desperately indulge in the Old Blood. As we later learn, it would be the Old Blood's effect on humans that would cause the scourge of the beast. On the precipice of this realisation, the Healing Church would create a coven of hunters who would initially, in secrecy, slay the most afflicted as PR damage control to avoid revolts against the Healing Church's liability. Fearing retribution, some would resort to very crude remedial methods, one of which was bloodletting, spearheaded by an old hunter named Brador who would popularise the treatment in Old Yarnum. Both the bloodletting and acts of the hunters would do little to stop the scourge of the beast and lay the foundations for a population of dual infected citizens, poisoned with the ashen blood and the scourge of the beast simultaneously, alongside the habit of bloodletting even in their already dire condition. One of such residents would later be known as the Bloodstarved Beast. Because of the Bloodstarved Beast's position at the altar in the Church of the Good Chalice, its unusual size and strength for the area, we can extrapolate that the Beast was possibly once a leader of the organised religion in the Valley Hamlet of Old Yarnum that worked closely with the Healing Church itself. The Sword Hunter badge tells us the biggest and most powerful beasts are born of the people who had the closest affiliation to the church and therefore proximity to the old blood. And as a leader of the church, the Bloodstarved Beast would have had access to more blood than the average old Yarnamite. 
The beast's appearance indicates that whoever the blood-starved beast was, they were also infected with the ashen blood illness, as the longer the battle goes on, the more toxic being in the presence of the beast becomes. It's in this reasoning that the bloodletting beast holds much of the merit of the cleric beast and even Vicar Amelia, who will come later in the list, but is let down by its inherent poisonous ashen blood and its self-inflicted bloodletting lacerations. As much of the potency of beasthood relates to the properties of the old blood, this is a major drawback. However, it is still a being that was some of the first to administer the blood of the church, and from various item descriptions, we learn that the potency of one's bestial nature is closely affiliated with how long they were able to fend off the curse. The blood-starved beast's position in the church and physical size favour this description, indicating whoever it was was powerful enough for beasthood to transform them into a very distinctly powerful being when compared to regular Yarnamites. While the law of the Watchdog is inherently tied to the law of the Keeper of the Old Lords and the Thumerians, which is a story for much later in the video, what is to be told here is that the Thumerian civilization was underpinned by one key duty, to preserve the Great Ones in their presence, but also preserve them in their absence. While Thumerian civilization continued in the absence of Great Ones with bureaucracy and hierarchies, the most powerful Thumerians were the closest to the aspects of the Old Great Ones. At the head of this institution were the Keepers of the Old Lord. I don't want to spoil too much about the Keepers, as it's one of my favourite bits of lore in the game. What we need to know here is that their role was incredibly important in their respective society, and their power was equal to that importance. While the Keepers often conducted themselves alone, we can assume they, much like the humans of our society, employed watchdogs to aid them in their task. The Watchdogs of the Old Lords is one of such a being. In a lot of ways, the Watchdogs were ordinary animals for Thumerian civilization, not unlike Watchdogs of our own. But the distinct nature of these Watchdogs were their size. Almost mythical in proportion, it's not difficult to envisage the Keepers even riding these beasts. Another peculiar aspect of the dogs are that they are enveloped in fire. Fire in Thumerian society, as we will once again learn later in more detail, is the regional arcane art likely brought down from Great Ones, as all magical sources in Bloodborne are. And the Keepers, by the virtue of their proximity to the Great Ones, were the most proficient in this art. It's therefore not a stretch to assume their friary presence is a result of enhancements brought down from Great Ones to the Watchdogs, to make them even more proficient as forces of nature. It's for this reason the Watchdog of the Old Lords, unlike beasts already mentioned, are bolstered by the Thumerian aspect of fire. Rallying their size and companionship with the Keepers, they tower above the less sophisticated Thumerian adjacent beings and are unsurprisingly seen as competent enough for such a noble task, landing them here on the list. Coming off the last entry, we learn that the art of pyromancy was intrinsically linked to the Thumerians, and the core theory regarding their affinity for fire is related closely to their relationship with the Great Ones as a civilization. Unlike Thumeru, Loran existed after the events of the early Thumerian societies. Although not much detail about Loran is granted to us in the game, there is one aspect of Loran that underpins the grand narrative of their story. This of course being the sin of blood ministration. Loran is the only part of the Chalice Dungeons that shares beasts not too dissimilar to those in the main game. We learn this is the case as Loran were the first in the timeline to indulge in the old blood. Theories can be made that Loran, envying the previous kingdom's closeness to the Great Ones, sought a similar relationship but chose to do it instead through their blood. Not unlike how the healing church of Yarnum would do so too. Willem first to openly speak on the dangers of this acknowledged Loran as a mirror of our own human ambitions and his disagreement would give way to the Bergenworth Healing Church schism. 
Loran became host to all assortments of beasts, and we get an insight into how the beast plague of Loran compares to our own. It's likely the beast possessed soul is that of a Thumerian or Thumerian adjacent slash descended race succumbing to the plague of the beast via the old blood. I make this assertion as it is the only beast in the game that commands pyromancy in its own repertoire, a distinct characteristic of Thumerian civilization. Maintaining a slender figure and quick movement, this comparison holds some ground, but I think the most evidence of this lays in what we can learn from ailing Loran ourselves. The residents from the Bell Maidens to the clerics all share Thumerian characteristics. It is not difficult therefore to draw the assumption that the beasts of Loran are not just regular human to beast beings, but rather Thumerian to beast enemies, once again exemplified by their ability to use pyromancy. Thumerians have a lot of credit in the law as being superhuman, and the beasts therefore would carry down this trait too. While a low-ranking beast when compared to the more daunting dark beasts, the beast-possessed soul is still a greater being than most regular ones of Yharnam, and the use of pyromancy adds an element of arcane to a fight with an archetype of enemy that usually relies on pure physicality, and therefore lands itself a position here on the list. For the first time in this list, we can venture into the story of the choir, as the living failures are in every way the footprints of ironically one of the most, if not the most successful sections of the healing church in attaining the ultimate goal of human evolution. The choir, though birthed from the healing church, was less concerned with the administration of the old blood, although it's likely the choir was the aspect of the church responsible for sourcing this resource. The duty of sourcing the old blood came from their close affiliations with Abritus, the assumed source of the old blood found originally in the Thumerian labyrinths. Clues as to Abritus being the source is seen countless times in the game, from Abritus being the only physically present great one in the Thumerian labyrinths to where we find Abritus, right at the bottom of the old grand cathedral, deep within the cathedral ward. Something further evidenced by Gilbert's dialogue telling us deep within the cathedral ward is the old Grand Cathedral, the birthplace of the healing church's special blood. We know Ibritus was passive to humans, something we get to see from the boss fight with her in the main game, but that begs the question, why was this great one so accepting of humanity? While Ibritus' story is for her own entry on this list, what we need to know here is that the choir had built a mutual relationship with Ibritus, as Ibritus is told to have been abandoned by her race suddenly and yearns to reconnect with her own kind. The choir built as a mechanism for the healing church to also reach out to the cosmos, aligned itself with the Great One to work with Abritus in reaching out to the cosmos. Evidently, Abritus accepted this agreement and even offered her own blood to the church for their help, giving us an explanation as to how the healing church had such a large pool of the old blood to administer freely. How exactly the choir were able to commune with the Britus and think to fulfill the goal to reach out to the cosmos can be seen through both the main game and the DLC. We learn through the main game and with the successes of the Celestial Emissaries that the goal was to mimic Bergamoth's success with Rom and to create a being that would assume kinship to the Great Ones. However, before the successes of the Celestial Emissary, there was a trail of failures. We learned that the choir would experiment in a place renowned as the Orphanage. The key to the Orphanage tells us the Orphanage, shadowed by the Grand Cathedral, was a place of scholarship and experimentation, where young orphans became potent, unseen thinkers for the healing church. Although we can see many lesser failed experiments throughout Bloodborne, specifically in relation to the upper area of Yusefka's clinic, in the DLC we meet something outright described to us as living failures. The Living Failures is a group of beings that are suspected to have been a halfway stuck version of the Celestial Emissaries. In this, they were neither kin to the Great Ones nor human, instead something in between, a failure of both forms. 
Despite their name, they are not completely redundant. We learn the living failures are resulted from very crude experiments. These experiments would in many cases defect the user, but bring them an increased level of insight. We learn from the brain fluid item that in the early days of the healing church, the great ones were linked to the ocean. And so the cerebral patients would imbibe water and listen for the howls of the sea. Brain fluid writhed inside the head, the initial makings of internal eyes. It is the section on internal eyes that gives us more context as to the power they held. Though technically failures, they harboured a greater level of insight encouraged by their internal eyes, which call forth Master Willem of Bergenworth's assertion that internal eyes are the precondition to ascension. It's therefore not surprising that although physically redundant, the living failures are able to conjure spells that call forth the cosmos itself. Their heightened insight is likely the closest we get to an actual kin of the Great Ones without being kin themselves. It is therefore their ability to call forth aspects of the cosmos that make them a difficult foe for any ordinary hunter, but their physical deformities and their inability to truly take shape as celestial emissaries confine their position here on the list. There are only a few hunters we get to face as boss battles in the game, but from both a gameplay and lore-based perspective, these battles are almost always the greatest spectacles. All of the hunter-based boss battles encapsulate the sheer horror of both the Beast Plague but more importantly, the hunters who are not too far from beasts themselves. Father Gascoigne was from a distant land. His title too was likely earned due to his religious affiliations from this distant land, suggesting he was the leader of a religious order. Why Gascoigne had left this land for Yarnum is never elaborated on, but his affinity to a higher power may be the core reason, as Yarnum and the Healing Church were beginning to make a name for themselves across the globe as miracle workers due to the properties of the old blood and blood ministration. Gascoigne quickly rose the ranks of the Healing Church and was eventually assigned the role of a hunter, finding companionship with another hunter named Henrique. The two are notable as fierce hunters worthy of named distinction. Their actions are echoed throughout the game and we learn that they endured many hunting nights and were at the height of the black-robed Healing Church hunters that purged beasts from within. It's not clear how long Gascoigne's tenure as a hunter was, but we know it was long enough for the residents to refer to him specifically as Minister, something evidenced by a little easter egg we can get by wearing his robes and challenging beast-ridden Yarnamites. Gascoigne's story up to the point that we meet him is tragic, coated in love, loss, and remorse. It's clear by the time we meet him, he is at the brink of beasthood having either murdered or witnessed the murder of his wife. Our fight tells us two different things. Firstly, is that he was an incredibly proficient hunter, utilising a trick weapon as well as you'd expect he would, and even turning into a beast at the end of the fight. There are a few ways we can measure Gascoigne's strength here. Firstly, is the story. We know who is able to stand beside Henrique and endured countless hunts enough to call for distinction of his own. There are many hunters, but only few gained a position of authority and even few are named in stories. The second is his beasthood. Having held back beasthood as long as he did, once transformed, it's clear he is more than just an ordinary hunter turned beast. His size, ferociousness and speed indicate he was, even as a beast, above the litter. Testament to his ability to indulge in the hunt and the old blood all the way up until we meet him face to face. However, what brings Gascoigne down in comparison to later entries is that he and Henrique at the point that we meet them have clearly lost much of their hunting capabilities succumbing to their beast form. Though grander than regular beasts in Yarnum, they are still clearly much less potent than the later cleric beasts and other beasts to follow. We never really learn what Gascoigne's achievements were outside of being told he worked during the early days of purging beasts in Yarnum. We learn in later entries the greater hunters of Yarnum were under the supervision of Ludwig, referenced by the Holy Blades. And it is these Holy Blades that would turn into the much greater beasts, indicating their much greater resilience and power compared to more regular hunters like Gascoigne.
The origins of the One Reborn are probably one of the more contentious topics in Bloodborne, especially as it ties closely to the very cryptic nature of the School of Mensis. So what I will do is outline a few theories that hold credit and go with some commonality between the theories to build out the boss alongside what we know explicitly of its strengths and weaknesses. What we definitely know about the One Reborn is that it's conjured into the world via an old Thumerian ritual regarding bell ringing, a consistent theme of calling upon other planes of existence. It looks to be an amalgamated flesh with a variety of mangled corpses as an almost coordinated entity. It's suggested that these are the bodies of Yarnamites and maybe what the school of Mensis had done with the humans it had experimented on after their bodies were exhausted for scientific gain. The most common theory is that the School of Mensis used the One Reborn as a final defense mechanism against any whom that sought to interfere with the ritual of Mensis, Mikalash, and the Nightmare. There are conflicting theories about how this is done. Some chalk it up to a Thumerian ritual conjured by Thumerian bell maidens that had allied themselves to the School of Mensis. Others have furthered the nuance that the One Reborn is unlike other beings summoned by the bells, as unlike hunters crossing plains, the One Reborn seems to be a forced amalgamation lashing out in pain rather than purpose. There are also very elaborate speculations about the One Reborn being a product of the School of Mensis, seeking a physical body for the brain of Mensis in a convoluted plan to create a Great One or even an Amygdala. In reality, it's difficult to really stamp credibility on the speculative theories about the One Reborn, and if we utilize Occam's Razor, we can come to some ground in building out the threat profile for the One Reborn. We know the One Reborn is definitely a tool utilized by Mensis, and assuming it is indeed the final bulwark for the most sensitive part of the entire institution, we can assume the School of Mensis that was deeply influential and abundantly resourced had a large degree of faith in the One Reborn or even the Bell Maidens in repelling any threat powerful enough to come to the literal gates of the institution. We also know the component parts of the One Reborn are regular Yarnamites fused together attacking in a mostly physical manner, which is somewhat redeemed as the boss fight occurs alongside an array of Thumerian bell maidens. As we come to see, Thumerians themselves, when using only the law, bear powers beyond human comprehension and are the step between human and great ones, adding a more dynamic element to the boss fight and even adding assurance as to why the School of Mensis chose for the One Reborn to take on the role as its final line of defense. The School of Mensis became quite accustomed to using the bodies of the deceased as a defense mechanism throughout the area. From the school itself to Yaha Ghul, it's likely the School of Mensis did not see them as a be-all and end-all defense mechanism, but something to bide enough time to carry out the abhorrent ritual that would grant them access to the nightmare of Mensis. Something once complete would render the school itself a redundant institution left behind in a lesser plane. It's for these reasons the One Reborn, though a powerful entity, Entity is not entirely indicative of the great power of the School of Mensis, but powerful enough to be deemed necessary while the school was still in active operation. It's for this reason the One Reborn ranks here on the list. Previously on this list, we spoke about the art of bloodletting introduced by the later hunter of Yarnum called Brador, but in truth, bloodletting as a remedial treatment can be seen in much earlier cultures than that of Yarnum. Bloodletting, of course, references the practice of reducing your own blood supply, something we see even in the real world through medieval treatments of humours. We learn in the game that the scourge of the beast is not just a Yarnum specific phenomenon. In fact, administering the old blood was a practice first seen in the previous kingdom of Loran. If you brave the Chalice Dungeon, you can find the old civilization buried below Yarnum. Loran, in many ways, was the foreshadowing of Yarnum's own beast plague, something likely acknowledged by a large section of the Bergenworth prospectors who would first uncover the labyrinth. Willem's adage of fearing the old blood was likely a logical conclusion on the basis of this observation. The healing church, of course, believing themselves above this future, chose to cast a blind eye and establish an institution around its administration. We learn in more detail that Loran was in fact also administering the old blood, and the parallels between Yarnum and Loran became clearer the closer the healing church got to integrating the old blood into their own society. 
Much like Yharnam, Loran was also plagued with all assortments of beasts. The concept of those holding back the plague the longest becoming the greatest beasts apply here too. Although there are many lesser beasts in Loran, there are also greater beasts, one of which was the bloodletting beast. The bloodletting beast, though sharing colloquial parallels with the blood-starved beast, is much greater in every aspect. Firstly, and most prominent, is that the bloodletting beast was not afflicted with the ashen blood plague, and had not completely rid itself of the potent blood that caused its initial mutations. But more importantly of the differences is that the bloodletting beast seems to be much more greater and notable in its ability to consume and maintain itself alongside the old blood. We don't know how long the civilization of Loran had lasted, but it's clear when we compare the bloodletting beast to the other Loran beasts, it holds distinct merits of its own. Comprising of a much bigger size, the bloodletting beast was definitely a being much more powerful in staving off the beast plague and succumb to its adverse effects much later in its life. Details about why the bloodletting beast practiced bloodletting is foggy, but likely connected to how it was adamant about not allowing beasthood to take form and may have even been successful in postponing this transformation. It is important to acknowledge too that the practice of bloodletting likely made the beast less potent as a threat, as the old blood at the point of the beasthood is closely affiliated with how much power was retained by the beast at the encounter. It is further reason as to why the bloodletting beast lands above the blood starved beast, but also below other beasts of the same nature such as the Cleric Beast. The Bloodletting Beast shares striking parallels to the greater beast of Yharnam such as the Cleric Beast, Amelia and even Lawrence, indicating it must have been quite high in the hierarchy of Loran society. However, there is little other context relating to the bloodletting beast and the nuance of his head appearing in some fights and not in others is anybody's guess. Regardless, the bloodletting beast was likely Loran's cleric beast equivalent, leading us perfectly to our next entry. To echo the sentiment from the last entry and the item descriptions of items such as the Sword Hunter badge, beasthood, or more so the potency of beasthood, is measured against two factors how much blood was administered and how long the being in question was able to retain humanity alongside this administration before they turned into a beast. We learn the healing church held a bureaucracy of its own not too dissimilar to churches of our own world, with clerics, priests and vicars. We learn that despite the healing church's attempt to cover up the plague of the beasts in Old Yarnum, they too were drinking their own Kool-Aid, and were consistently maintaining a position of advocacy over the ministration of the Old Blood. Many of the founding members of the Healing Church were from Bergenworth, and are likely responsible for sourcing the Old Blood in the first place. Although not all the members of the Healing Church schism held named distinction, it's likely all were administering the Old Blood from the offset. Of course, Lawrence and his company did so believing evolution stood at the foot of this new resource. The resource at face did offer otherworldly benefits, such as its incredible healing properties, something that all hunters would rely on as a form of medical nourishment. But it wasn't just the hunters who built a reliance on this medium. While we have covered much of why old Yarnum chose to indulge in the practice of blood ministration, many other Yarnumites chose to do so too, assuming no disadvantages. Unfortunately, the dealings of great ones is rarely ever so simple, and for the weaker Yarnumites, the practice of blood ministration would begin transforming them into beasts quite quickly. Initially, a secret coven of hunters would be established by the healing church to deal with the plague in secrecy to avoid mass hysteria. But eventually, specifically after the cordoning of old Yarnum, the church itself openly had established its own more public group of hunters to continue this campaign. The Healing Church positioned this tactically by asserting the plague of the beast as a common threat for both the populace and the church without acknowledging their own liability. Yarnumites took this call and joined forces against the beast without realising their own impending beasthood. At the forefront of this public campaign was Ludwig and his Holy Blades. While Ludwig's story comes later in the list, what we need to know here is that Ludwig amassed a group of fellow hunters to publicly stand against the scourge, and we learn from the radiant and regular sword hunter badge that it was many of Ludwig's more powerful disciples referred to as ancient line of warriors that would turn into the most powerful beasts. The Sword Hunter badge dropped by the Cleric Beast also tells us Ludwig was the first of many Healing Church hunters to come, many of whom were clerics. As it was, 
clerics transformed into the most hideous beasts. From this, we learn the hunt itself would further accelerate the potency of the plague of the beast onto the hunters, and the most prominent hunters of the Holy Blade would become the accursed cleric beasts, beings of high nobility in the church who became the most ravenous beast on the virtue of strength and faith in holding back the plague, but also indulging in the hunt itself. Cleric beasts were specifically pent up on the old blood from close contact with the afflicted, but also the early introduction of the resource into themselves. It's for this reason they share many of the strengths of the bloodletting beast as originally powerful hunters, but with the caveat they are sufficiently blood fueled and further accelerated in their form by the hunt itself. Boasting immense size, speed, and continued bloodthirst from their hunts, the Cleric Beast is an example of some of the greater beasts in the game, and it's not surprising they share characteristics of later entries of humans so powerful and notable, such as Lawrence and Vicar Amelia. Although this entry is concerning the unnamed Cleric Beast we fight in the game, the race of Cleric Beasts include Vicar Amelia and Lawrence, and it's this connection that also provides a basis as to why this entry solidifies a position here on the list. As we later learn, this race of beasts were no pushover at all. Even just a member of this section of beasthood grants a position this high on the list. A cornerstone for great power in the Bloodborne series are the Thumerians, a race of beings who shared just enough characteristics with modern humans for them to be acknowledged as humanoid, but held from either birth or close encounters with the Great Ones a uniquely transcendental nature. The history of Thumerians is shrouded in mystery, but it's clear they were the ruling class of beings before the creation of Yharnam. Thumerians were in many ways the step between humans and old Great Ones, and their closeness to Great Ones often was predicated on their inherent insight and ability to commune effectively with the greater beings. Thumerians at some point cohabited with the old Great Ones and even built labyrinths alongside them to signify their mutual commitment. Thumerian monarchs would be raised by Great Ones as bureaucracy of old kingdoms with kings, queens and high nobility. We are told many times that all Thumerians held such great insight that the Great Ones who are so quick to abandon even the most inquisitive humans were receptive to their existence and potential. While Thumerians themselves have since majorly reduced their numbers, some still exist in the old labyrinth and even few of nobility exist too. One of which of this nobility are the Thumerian descendants. Although there is no information regarding the specificities of this Thumerian descendant, it's clear from their aesthetics they occupied royal esteem and the Thumerian descendant is likely a close descendant of the royal family itself. We see in later entries that Thumerians were almost superhuman in design and not just relative to their insight, but also their power and speed. Boasting greater than human physiology, it's not surprising why the Great Ones elected for this race of beings to watch over their domain as both confidants but also guardians. We learn the ranking of Thumerian civilization was predicated on knowledge, but also the power they wielded. It's not surprising therefore to learn in later entries how it was only the most powerful Thumerians that stood closest to the Great Ones, but between keepers of the tombs and monarchs were the noblemen. The Thumerian descendant as a member of this noble faction is therefore no simple threat and exemplifies why the tomb prospectors led by German required the construction of trick weaponry and an entire workshop to overcome. The Thumerian descendant, however, is lacking one key aspect that places him much lower than the more higher ranking beings, that being its ability to utilize fire. We aren't given much context as to how Thumerians garnered such a strength in their repertoire, but we know it's closely linked to how close they were to the Great Ones, which in turn was also how powerful they were as individuals. We know this is the case as the Thumerian elder later in the list does have the power of fire within his repertoire, and so do the shadows of Yharnam closely tied to the queen who of course was bearing the child of a great one herself. It's for this reason the Thumerian descendant, though powerful, ranks as low as it does as a surviving member of the Thumerian royalty. Utilising the physiology of a high-ranking Thumerian and clear proficiency with weapons and a form of combat native to their society, but lacking the fire that exemplifies Thumerians much closer to the Great Ones.
In our later entry regarding Ludwig, we learn of a pact of men associated with the healing church known as the Holy Blades, although I'll be doing a much deeper dive into the Holy Blades in Ludwig's respective entry on this list, we can learn from the Radiant Sword Hunter badge that the Holy Blades were what remains of an ancient line of warriors that date back to a very early age of honour and chivalry. Although we can see aspects of what truly remains of the Holy Blades in the game with the existence of certain hunters turned beasts, such as the Cleric Beast that specifically drop the item required to obtain Ludwig's Holy Blade, but between the hunters living and those turned beasts are the madmen of the Chalice Dungeons. Wielding Ludwig's Holy Blade and Ludwig's Rifle, it appears this Holy Blade was more than just a member of Ludwig's exclusive club of hunters. He also has an affinity with the Arcane. As close affiliations with the Arcane is never truly spoken of regarding Ludwig's Holy Blades, we can assume the Mad Men garnered this ability through his adventures through the Chalice Dungeons, disconnected from his duties as a Beast Slayer of Yharnam. This Arcane affinity manifests itself through various Cosmos-related abilities tied closely with Abritus, and it would not be a stretch to suggest this specific member of the Holy Blades was also closely affiliated too with the Tomb Prospectors and choir associated with finding and bringing Abritus to the Grand Cathedral. So with the above being said, this boss utilising the esteem of Ludwig's exclusive coven of fighters and abilities of the extremely powerful choir must land a very high position on this list. However, not unlike the other members of Ludwig's Holy Blades and Ludwig himself, the madman is of course mad, likely due to being unable to truly grasp the insight required to call upon great ones without being consumed himself. It's this maddening in question that demotes this entry as far as it does. However, his position as a member of Ludwig's Holy Blades and also his ability to utilise powers of the choir that are exclusively associated with extremely high-ranking members of the institution solidify him as an extremely powerful enemy on this list. However, he is also teamed up with another hunter wielding a Kirkhammer, a weapon devised at the Healing Church workshop, reaffirming his position as a member of the Healing Church, but also adding a more dynamic element to this boss battle that has you go up against a team member that is likely a proficient hunter of the Healing Church's workshop, although not specifically to the esteem related to the Holy Blades. The Forgotten Madman, likely lost in the depths of the Chalice Dungeon, is one of the few living members of the Healing Church's greatest military wing, but also has the incredibly unique joint affiliation with the power of the Choir too, demonstrating arcane abilities only associated with the greatest members of the institution. Though his maddened state dampens the gravity of the battle, he still wields and utilises aspects of both the Holy Blades and the Choir together in a way no other enemy in Bloodborne does, and in many ways exemplifies some of the greatest strengths of the Healing Church in one place. He is a Tomb Prospector, a Holy Blade, and a Choir member all in one place, and the battle is symbolic of the power the Healing Church used to terrorise and disrupt the resting Chalice Dungeons, and in many ways we take on a role not too dissimilar to what we would expect the Thumerians had to face in the Chalice Dungeons during the Healing Church's campaign against their resting tombs. It's for this reason the Forgotten Madman ranks above the Cleric Beast as a bona fide member of the Holy Blades that retained humanity despite the campaign against beasts, but also above the Thumerian descendant as they were likely the victims of the Healing Church Tomb Prospectors, an exemplification of the type of beings the Healing Church overcame in the plundering of the Labyrinths. The Forgotten Madman, a symbol of that very power, lost in the tombs but evidence of their campaign. Queen Yarnum is an interesting entity on this list as she is the only truly important boss that appears exclusively in the Chalice Dungeons. Her story of course extends much further than the old labyrinth. We encounter the Queen a few times in the game, the most prominent of which is before the player encounters Mergo and the wet nurse in the Nightmare of Mensis. Of course, at this point the Queen seems completely harmless and acts more as an environmental cue for the theme of the boss battle. 
But Queen Yonam's influence is much more than just her affiliation with baby Mergo. Of course, the land we play in is named after her, as was the tradition for old Thumerian civilizations to be reigned over by a queen that bore the child of a great one. But her influence is yet again even more than just her namesake in Yarnum, for Queen Yarnum held the source of power that brought another region a call for distinction too. During Bergamot's delve into the Thumerian labyrinths, we learn that the prospectors came across the Old Blood, a resource so potent the most powerful institution in Yarnum would be built around it. But in the sly details, we also learn of a Bergamot scholar that found another resource in the tombs, the Vile Blood. We soon learn that the Vile Blood was the blood of a still pregnant Queen Yarnum that bore the child of Great One Erdun. It's not surprising, therefore, that much like the Old Blood, the blood of Queen Yarnum would also pique the interest of the Bergenworth scholars. One of said scholars would bring the blood back to the distant Canehurst. This blood, of course, would be the bedrock of Canehurst's future reputation, a story we'll go into much more detail in coming entries. But what we need to know here is that we learn the old blood of Queen Yarnum was so potent it would grant extraordinary effects and even near immortality to those who would administer it. Such is the case for Queen Annalise. With this being said, surely Queen Yarnum, the source of this power, would be an extraordinary force. But of course, when dealing with the power of Great Ones, such things are never that easy. The Queen Yarnum we meet in the tombs is interestingly still pregnant, which may be a projection of her former self in time. Her connections with Erden may be the reason she's able to exist at two places at once. We even learn in later entries, heavy trauma associated with Great Ones can create parallel planes of existence where time is convoluted, as is the case for both the Hunter's Nightmare and Dream. The version of Yarnum we face is still hosting Erden's baby, and we get to learn what impact it had on her fighting abilities. She's able to use a few extraordinary abilities even for Thumerian standards. In the fight, she's able to manipulate blood and even become formless as an aspect of blood. However, bearing the Great One's child also seems to have decimated her own quality of life, seemingly suffering. It's clear even during our boss battle with Yarnum, her pregnancy is doing more to debilitate her than enhance her fighting prowess. For the Hawkeye gamers, we learn too that the Queen Yarnum we fight is shackled during this battle, which may be the source of the trauma associated with this projection of Yarnum, as it's assumed the tomb prospectors were anything but gentle in their pillaging of the Thumerian labyrinths and may even be responsible for triggering what happens to be the later traumatic stillbirth that would send baby Mergo, her child, to the nightmare of Mensis. Although we learn much about the potency of the Marian's fighting abilities and their role as designated protectors of Great Ones, it's clear Queen Yarnum's own strength was being significantly stifled by bearing the child of a Great One. It's not surprising that only the monarch of the Thumerian race were deemed powerful enough to bear the child of a Great One, as of course this required tremendous strength but also sacrifice. It explains too why the shadows of Yarnum were an official post held by those described as master combatants in the official game guide. As Thumerian societies were reverent of Great Ones and any Thumerian that bore the eldritch cargo of a Great One's child would be sacred and protected by all measures. Although this is not to say a pregnant Queen Yarnum was not still a powerful being, as she was still likely enriched to some degree by the aspect of Erden growing inside of her, and any projection of Erden is not to be understated. However, when we do battle Queen Yarnum in the game, she is shackled, traumatized, and heavily pregnant. But her affinity to Erden and her abilities to utilize blood suggest even though she is symbolic of a victim of human greed, she still holds eldritch powers that gave the entire kingdom of Canehurst enough notoriety the healing church itself led an executive war against toppling them. This is why Queen Yarnum ranks here on the list, a truly unique encounter where we are in some ways able to challenge a small aspect of Erden, albeit through a tortured and debilitated medium. The origins of the Dark Beast are one of those true gaps in Bloodborne lore. The information we do have relate the beings to the Scourge of the Beast, but their appearance seems very different to the regular beasts of the game. There are theories that the Dark Beast are an evolved form of the Scourge of the Beast, and other theories suggesting parallels between it and the Bloodletting Beast. 
But from the exposition, we get through the Chalice Dungeons and stories of Irreverent Izzy, which is a story for our next entry. The Dark Beasts seem to be exclusively native to Loran and therefore may be Themerian in descendants, much like the Beast Possessed Soul. As already discussed, the strength of beasthood is relative to the original being that would be turned into a beast. The more powerful the being, the longer the retained humanity despite administering more blood. Evidence of this can be found through law related clues in item descriptions, but also by the size and ferocity of the beast as evidenced in earlier entries such as that of the Cleric Beast. The Dark Beast shares a size and design similar to that of the Cleric Beast, but has a few unique features that may shed more light on how powerful they actually were. The Spark Hunter badge tells us that the Dark Beasts were able to generate blue sparks from just their hide. This generation of electricity can be seen in other parts of the game through Bolt Paper and the Tenitrus, inventions of Archibald, the inventor who would be inspired by Dark Beasts and subsequently create Bolt Paper and other weaponry to mimic the lightning properties. We learn from the description of Bolt Paper that Archibald's mimicry would become an essential tool to many successful hunters, and specifically those who had ever laid eyes on a Dark Beast. It's referenced countless times in the game that hunters that encountered Dark Beasts were either afraid or outright mesmerized by its power. Irreverent Izzy, a renowned prospector for the Healing Church, would even dedicate his entire life to becoming an aspect of the Dark Beast, sacrificing his own favor with the Healing Church to do so. The description of the Dark Beast indicate it's not only an extremely rare variant of the beast, but also a spectacle that would inspire a coven of hunters to adopt its properties, specifically the extremely successful school of Mensis. Mensis, as pure opportunists, seeing the potential to utilize the power of a Dark Beast, were familiarized with much of Archibald's invention and had harnessed this in their own repertoire. A core function of the school were the Hunters of Yahagul, and the first line of defense against meddling hunters seeking to disrupt the ritual of Mensis, granting further merit to the power of Archibald's Dark Beast-derived inventions. We also learn in the next entry how Izzy was able to maintain much of his power through Dark Beasts. And without spoiling too much, this power would be so successful, he would be accountable for various notable killings in Yharnam and pronounce fear within the Healing Church itself, while creating a new form of beasthood derived combat that harnessed becoming a beast intentionally. The Dark Beast we fight in the main game goes by Paul, likely affectionately named by Archibald as it was the subject of his experimentations that granted the knowledge of Bolt Paper and Bolt derived weaponry. As Dark Beasts are what remain of Loran, you have to ask yourself how powerful were these beasts to inspire a group of prospectors and even the School of Mensis to try to mimic their prowess, something seldom seen for any other variant of beasts in the entire game. It's for for this reason, our encounter with either of the Dark Beast bosses is the pinnacle of beasthood from the Withered Kingdom of Loran, the epitome of a threat that buried an entire kingdom in time. This is where we go into more speculative grounds, but I think a great case can be made for both the origins of the Abhorrent Beast, but also its power. I believe the story of the Abhorrent Beast is both the story of the Dark Beasts, but also the story of a peculiar hunter and former Healing Church tomb prospector known as Irreverent Izzy. We learn after the events of Bergamot's retreat from the old labyrinth, the Healing Church, determined to put the old blood to use, formed their own version of the Tomb Prospectors. We learn that a man named Irreverent Izzy was one of such prospectors. Although the Healing Church may have explored a great deal of the labyrinth by the time we are introduced to the world, Izzy himself had built a keen fascination with the part that housed Ailing Loran. As we found out in the previous entry, Ailing Loran was notable for hosting Dark Beast, a form of beast seldom found anywhere else and powerful and unique enough to command the specified attention of prospectors throughout the game. Inspired, Izzy would seek to replicate the immensity of the Dark Beast's power and would refashion weaponry from the beast. The description of the Beast Claw reads, weapon wielded by irreverent Izzy, crafted by chiseling the long bones of an undead Dark Beast. In time, the wielder of this weapon surges with both strength and feverish reverie. 
Izzy's fascination with the Dark Beast and the replication of bestial might would cause the Healing Church to disdain his work. The Healing Church, of course, at the forefront of the campaign of purging beasts, saw this both as bad PR, but more importantly, counterintuitive to their own end goals of human ascension, rather than what they saw as dissension into beasthood. Izzy's disconnect from the Healing Church is likely why he holds the title irreverent, meaning lack of respect, but more importantly, the Japanese translation comes out to apostate, alluding to Izzy's choice to turn his back on the religion of the Healing Church. Although we are never given any context as to what happened to Izzy, it's in my opinion that Izzy is the abhorrent beast. Of course, abhorrent referencing the Healing Church's disdain for his research and the title likely normalised due to the Healing Church's ruling moral authority in Yharnam. But more important to this connection is the suspicious beggar we find in the game. Reddit user Saw Cleaver Enthusiast from the Bloodborne subreddit outlines a very convincing case showing the suspicious beggar that transforms into the abhorrent beast in the main game as Irreverent Izzy, drawing connections between the option for the beggar to grant the player beast pellets which were coagulated blood of beasts that grant temporary beasthood. But also Izzy's stated fascination with Loran and the dark beast that is told to be the only being able to generate electricity, a characteristic shared exclusively by the abhorrent beast. It's convincing too that we meet Izzy in the woods, a place where many victims of the scourge would go to hide from the eyes of the church hunters. In our encounter with the suspicious beggar, he transforms into the abhorrent beast and is the only beast in the game that is able to converse with us in this beastly form, suggesting this is Izzy as he was the only being named to have such mastery over this aspect of beasthood from a human form, a hypothesis further grounded by the Carol rune assigned to him which extenuates beast. Beasthood. So with assurance Izzy is the abhorrent beast, how powerful was he? In truth, there are a lot of factors that go into the strength of the abhorrent beast. Much of Izzy's strength lies in his truly unique ability to mimic beasthood unlike any other being in the game. The abhorrent beast was in many ways a masterful depiction of some of the greatest aspects of the dark beast and the beasts of Loran, mimicking their ferocity as described in the beast claw. But more importantly, it's the affinity for lightning. The abhorrent beast is the only other being able to inherently control lightning and therefore shares much of the merits associated with the dark beast. Although we are not given specific clues about the power of the Dark Beast, we can infer through the storyline of the Suspicious Beggar, it commanded enough power to kill a selection of other NPCs in Erden Chapel, from Sister Adela to Ariana. We also know the successes Izzy was notable for in the Labyrinth, and how he was able to kill Dark Beasts and also utilise their remnants to build on his own research. By extension, the Abhorrent Beast is Izzy in his most powerful form, having both mastered the Dark Beast, but also tamed beasthood to a degree not seen anywhere else in the game, exemplified by his ability to speak and remain coherent and even almost philosophical about the nature of beasthood and the immorality of the church hunters in our encounter with him. The battle with the abhorrent beast is against a truly unique hunter who not only mimicked one of the greatest forms of beasts in the game in the form of the dark beast, but also fuses this power with the coherency of a truly brilliant human and great hunter. The next two entries will be quick ones as much of the merit for Vicar Amelia and even Lawrence have already been stated in the entry for the Cleric Beasts. As beings of the same archetype, the merits of the Cleric Beast apply here too, but are brought much higher due to more unique aspects relative to the name distinction Amelia and Lawrence had. To surmise why Cleric Beasts are powerful, we learn becoming a Cleric Beast variant is predicated on how much blood was administered and how long the being in question was able to retain humanity alongside this administration. We know the Cleric Beast was a member of Ludwig's Holy Blade, a clergy of huntsmen dedicated to purging the plague of the beast that would in turn become even more ravenous beasts on the virtue of holding back beasthood but also consuming large amounts of the old blood as near founding members but also also indulging in the hunt itself. 
The story is not too dissimilar for both Vicar Amelia and Lawrence. While Lawrence was a founding member of the Healing Church, we learned that Amelia, titled Vicar, was granted the station as a stand-in for Lawrence in his absence, indicating she fell much closer to the founding of the institution. It's no surprise to see that Lawrence in our boss encounter is titled the First Vicar, for this reason exactly. Vicar Emilia, though a cleric beast, was one that both had likely consumed much more old blood, but also lasted as a human much longer before turning into a beast. In the game, we actually get to witness her transformation at the altar, indicating despite being there since the beginning, she only just succumbed to the overwhelming potency of the old blood. Physically, Vicar Amelia is much bigger than the ordinary cleric beast, but also harbours enough remaining sentience that she's able to cast a prayer that heals herself, indicating she is still able to resist the plague, testament to her lasting power. While the healing church itself is in tatters, we have to remember the institution still holds incredible influence in the land, with sister institutions that still remain exerting great influence over the land. Assuming Vicar Amelia is the appointed head of the main healing church, while many other members have already died or become beasts is further testament to her resilience and internal strength, making our battle with her resemble not only one with an advanced cleric beast, but also symbolic of the lasting power of the healing church in Yarno. To piggyback off the last entry, there isn't too much extra to say about Lawrence. While we will delve into much more exposition regarding Lawrence's story in later more grand entries, we learn that Lawrence here, much like Vicar Amelia, has too succumbed to the beast curse. Though his physical form is not present in the main game, in the DLC we can fight a projection of his being. Lawrence being the first of the healing church was likely the beast that had consumed the largest amount of the old blood. From the cleric beast entry we learn that the church were not averse to drinking their own Kool-Aid. Lawrence spearheading the hypothesis of human evolution through the old blood likely did so more than any other. Although we are not granted a timeline of how long Lawrence was able to stave off beasthood, it's very likely that he was around for the majority of the healing church's heyday, and his living influence can be seen throughout its history even today. There is a certain unique aspect to Lawrence's boss fight that's worth noting too. Not only was he likely the host of the largest amount of the old blood, but also in this fight he has a peculiar affinity with fire. This is something we see most prominently with the Marians. While this would seem to indicate Lawrence's scholarly past granted him some level of Thumerian insight, it's more likely that Lawrence's fiery form is symbolic of his tortured past. Lawrence encouraged much of Yarnum to indulge in the old blood, but also insisted on purging these beasts with fire that were a result of the blood's mutations. While the hunter's nightmare is harder to comprehend in terms of equivalence in power, we can assume as many things in the hunter's nightmare that Lawrence is a metaphor for the church's misdeeds. He, as a champion of the old blood, is also a victim of the fiery purging actions he promoted. Taking this into account, our battle with Lawrence is at a higher degree of eldritch proportion, as the Hunter's Nightmare is a plane created by the Great One Kaz as vengeance to meddling human ambition. Lawrence is a projection of his beastly form, but also, in a weird way, also an aspect of Kaz himself. It's for this reason, although not too dissimilar to Amelia, Lawrence is a greater threat to the Hunter than Amelia. While the background of this entry has mostly been covered in the previous entry for the Thumerian Descendant, the Thumerian Elder has a few key distinctions that place it far above it in terms of strength. As per the previous entry, Thumerians in Bloodborne are the race of beings that once cohabited with the Old Great Ones and built civilizations around their reverence to these beings. Due to their elevated insight, the Great Ones cohabited with the Thumerians on very mutual terms. From the previous Thumerian Descendant entry, we learn that the Thumerians are consistently described as superhuman in design. Their physiology towers over humans, and their insight and strength gave assurance to the Great Ones to elect the beings to watch over them in their own domain as both confidants and guardians. 
We also learn that the ranking of Thumerians and their civilization was based on their proximity to Great Ones, and it was the strongest of the race that would find themselves closest to the Great One. Queen of the civilization, Yarnum was to host the surrogate child, and a secret coven of Thumerians known as the Shadows to watch over the Queen, but also regular Thumerians to watch over their tombs. While the grandest title for the regular Thumerians were referred to as Keeper of the Old Lords, which is coming up on the list, those between regular Thumerians and the Keepers were Thumerian royalty. While we have discussed what makes the Thumerian descendants such a powerful being based on this premise, the Thumerian Elder symbolises why it had a much closer link to the Great Ones. In the entry for the Thumerian Descendant, we outlined the fact that it lacked a key aspect of its civilization that was symbolic for great Thumerian warriors. Of course, this was their affinity to fire. While there is little primary resources to indicate the Thumerians' ability to use fire was relative to their strength or closeness to Great Ones, we can deduce this is the case as high-ranking Thumerians dutied with the most sensitive tasks all had fire in their repertoire. This, of course, in the case of the Shadows of Yarnum, who are described as master warriors of the Thumerian race, but also the Keepers. But before those positions are the Thumerian Elders, who too had this affinity with fire. Our encounter with the Thumerian Elder is not too dissimilar to the Descendant. They are shaped the same and seem to carry the exact same heritage. However, one key difference is that the Thumerian Elder possesses a fire. A fire that is consistently and only associated with the higher ranking Thumerians and is even able to boast a mastery over a variety of Thumerian armaments, forming various different weapons at a whim. It's no illusion why the Elder is found deeper in the dungeons as their power would place them much closer to the Great Ones. While Thumerians are described as superhuman, the Elder is likely grand even amongst his own kind. The title of the Lesser Descendants are likely assumed on their descended relationship from the Elders, and our battle with the Elder is not only greater than that of the Descendant, but a battle that replicates what it would have been like to battle a true great surviving Thumerian that were the bedrock of what the Great One saw in their race as worthy of contact. It's not hard to imagine these Thumerian elders who are still at the foot of the Tomb of the Great Ones as being present the day the Great Ones ascended, living to protect their heritage on Earth and cast down their knowledge to their own descendants. This is why the Elder ranks so far above the descendants, as beings that directly had contact and confidence from the all-elusive Great Ones during their time on Earth, exemplified by a style of combat that is eldritch in design. I won't beat you down with too many details about the Celestial Emissary, as in truth, most of the backstory and origins for this entry have already been covered during the Living Failures entry already on this list. What there is to say here is that the Celestial Emissaries are clearly the choir's later successes in creating a medium between the Healing Church and Ebritus, something that is most likely accountable to their ability to converse with Ebritus, evidenced by Ebritus's cooperation with the Healing Church. A story I'll go into more detail about during Abritus' entry on this list. We learn the Celestial Emissaries are, in a similar sense as the Living Failures, a result of experimentation from the Orphanage to create kin not unlike Rom. However, unlike the Living Failures and more like Rom, the Celestial Emissaries were successful in attaining kinhood, evidenced by their pale blood and their association to Abritus. On this basis, the Celestial Emissary can be measured to the strengths of the Living Failures, but with the merit that they would command a greater affinity with the Cosmos, and therefore be able to conjure more powerful aspects of the Cosmos in our battle with them. Considering the nature of Insight being a great determining factor as to the power of a being in Bloodborne, just being a notable kin of the Great Ones, comparable only to Rom, places the Celestial Emissary as more than just a little bit more powerful than the Living Failures. Is. This level of kinship would suggest they were second to only Great Ones, able to conjure the power of Great Ones in battle. However, all instances of kin in Bloodborne share a vacuous and disassociated nature, a cruel irony that keeps them from being ruling powers as they are void of human ambition. 
It's for this reason that the Celestial Emissaries, much like the later entry of Rom, are held back to such a great degree. Their apathy to the world and almost lobotomized cadence, likely caused by the immensity of humans opening their minds to the knowledge of great ones, deeply affects kin. There is evidence to suggest the longer a kin is left to live and develop, they would become much greater forces, potentially great ones themselves. Both instances we meet kin as bosses in the game are during their infancy. While celestial emissaries seem childlike, Rom seems yet in a cocoon, and therefore we never get to experience this hypothesis. So unfortunately, the kin land much lower on this list in relation to where they stand in the hierarchy of things relative to Great Ones, leading perfectly to our next entry. There are only a few moments in gaming that have the effect of our encounter with Rom. Although Rom themselves is lackluster in both design and threat, when we learn of their purpose, Bloodborne changes. We quickly learn that the premise of the game we've been playing for so much time already was completely false. It goes from a story of hunters and beasts to a story of humanity and gods. We are suddenly tiny and the world is colossal. But who is Rom? In order to understand this, let's quickly recap what exactly happened at and to Bergenmerth. Bergamoth was an institution with one purpose, to further the limits of human intellect. And although there are no notable achievements made in the early years of the institution, one day the scholars had a breakthrough. They had discovered a labyrinth underground, a buried civilization. In this discovery, there were two major breakthroughs. The discovery of the old blood, which then fell the first domino to the later discovery of Koz. These discoveries split the Bergamoth institution into two separate factions. Master Willem, the head of the institution, would underpin the Loyalists, a sect of followers that sought wisdom through Kaz by focusing on insight. Lawrence would underpin the Radicals, a sect which disregarded insight in the place of faith, faith in transfusing the old blood with their own in the hope that they would ascend. Although we become quite familiar with the story of the Old Blood, it's the story of Kaz that brings us the enlightenment related to our encounter with Rom. We'll go into more detail about Kaz in our later entries, but what we need to know here is that upon Bergamoth's discovery of the dead Great One on the shores of the fishing hamlet, and once German and Maria brought back the Great One to Bergamoth, Master Willem discovered the one piece of evidence needed to confirm the existence of an eldritch truth. Willem tells us, we are thinking on the basis of planes. What we need are more eyes. A conclusion derived from the cord of the eye item, a crucial piece of the now dissected dead Great One. It's on this discovery Willem refused to acknowledge faith as a means of gaining ascension, but rather placed more effort into knowing. While the healing church utilised blood transfusion, Bergenworth adopted the practice of lining the brain with eyes, a half metaphorical, half literal concept of unlocking a deeper sight. This is exactly where we get to Rom. Rom in many ways is the fruit of Bergamoth's labour. Mikolash of Mensis alludes to the idea that Rom was likely a member of the Bergamoth institution that was granted eyes, allowing him to ascend to kinship with the Great Ones. Rom's ascension is very likely associated with the umbilical cord, Bergamoth scavenged from the fishing hamlet associated with the dead Great One Kaz, and its infant we later understand to be the orphan of Kaz. It's a common misconception that Rom is a Great One, but there is a major qualifying factor in determining what entities are true Great Ones in Bloodborne, that being the cold blood associated with them. When we slay Rom, we are given Kin Cold Blood. The description of Kin Cold Blood tells us, Cold Blood of the inhuman Kin of the Cosmos, Brethren of the Great Ones, immediately disqualifying it as a Great One, but promoting it from just a mere human. From dialogue clues and the official guide, we learn Kaz was something akin to a child. Its form even looks to be something similar to a cocoon, an infantile, defenseless form awaiting its grand homecoming. Immediately from this, we can start casting doubts as to its power. Very quickly, we learn that Rom is not an aggressive being, nor is it extremely powerful to the degree of Great Ones. 
Most of Rom's significance lay in their ability to commune with Great Ones, but in a cruel twist of fate, Rom is vacuous in every other manner, including their ability to relate with the human world, meaning Rom is completely unable to share any of its eldritch secrets. There are many cases throughout the game, such as the Deep Sea Room, that refer to Rom as an outright hindrance, demeaning its own physical defences against any of those who would seek its truth. Physically, Rom is a very incapable being, with little movement and a very large, vulnerable body. But Rom is a being of incredible insight, probably some of the greatest in the entire game. As a form of combat, we can equate insight as one of the main factors that determines a being's strength in Bloodborne. Rom is successfully able to leverage much of its own insight to use manifestations of energy and the moon, therefore subsequently the ocean too to fight back. In our battle against Rom, we have to navigate its ability to conjure eldritch spiderlings, but most importantly, the power of the moon and ocean we seldom see anywhere else in the game, testament to its unique prowess and grasp on insight as a last line of defense. However, the handicaps of Rom from descriptions of it being a completely unrealized infant or even just an outright hindrance alongside various item descriptions suggesting Rom was only able to maintain itself by hiding itself within the deep sea suggest just at the stage we meet Rom, it's not the greatest eldritch threat that there is, and the harder aspects of getting rid of this quote unquote hindrance is to find it in the first place. There is a world where Rom is further developed into a more capable being, just like the Celestial Emissary, potentially a Great One himself as well. Its close affiliations with Kaz, the Moon, and the Great Ones in general could make it one of the greatest threats in the entire game. Unfortunately for Rom, this future is never materialized, and Rom's life is cut short by a hunter seeking true sight of the horrors it was able to hold back. Rom's influence to hold back the moon presence demonstrates perfectly why it's a league above the Celestial Emissary as a kin, drawing much greater strength from the Great Ones, likely related to its association with the very powerful Great One Kaz, rather than the abandoned Abritus. It's for these reasons this almost Great One ranks so uncharacteristically low on the list, but still above the Celestial Emissaries, remaining an incredibly tough foe due to its ability to command the unique and colossal powers of the moon and an array of spiders from the source of its own eldritch knowledge. I won't bore you guys with any more background to the Thumerian, so I'll get straight to the point here. The Shadow of Yarnum are directly related to Queen Yarnum herself. We learn that Thumerian monarchs would be raised by Great Ones as bureaucracy of old kingdoms. The Ring of Betrothal tells us Great Ones would also use Thumerians as a means of reproduction too, which would explain why the greater beings did not just subjugate this class of humanoids as dutied protectors, but rather the relationship was truly quite mutual and complex. At the exemplification of this mutuality was the surrogate Thumerian mother to bear a great one of her own. In this, Queen Yarnum and the namesake of the mainland we play in was one of such surrogate mothers. Queen Yarnum's story was for earlier in the video though. What is important to be said here is that Queen Yarnum was a figure revered by her population of Thumerians, and in this population lay her own loyal servants known as the Shadows, beings that understood her eldritch cargo and the value of sustaining her life. Rarely in the main game do we get to go face to face with Thumerians, but of course Queen Yarnum's story is integral to our own, and sooner or later we are expected to run into her shadow. The shadows of Yarnum that we meet in boss form come as a trio, utilising an array of weaponry from curved swords and even mastery over fire in their repertoire. The official guide describes the shadows of Yarnum as three faceless creatures that appear to be human, but you'll soon find out that they were more. They are devoted to the queen they serve, mother of the child of blood. In their bloodless hands, they carry a weapon they once mastered. You'll be up against a blood-coated Chikage, a deadly blunt mace, and a lethal pyromancer. In this, it's likely the Shadows were not too dissimilar to the Keeper of the Old Lords, as in many ways the role of the Shadows were in fact watching over an aspect of their Old Lords in the form of Erdin's surrogate child. We see more of the Covenant of Thumerians known as the Shadows later in the game, 
but the ones we meet in boss form have a very peculiar difference. The shadows of Yharnam here are able to conjure serpents from their abdomen, but also as hydras in the boss battle. The serpents can be attributed to their prolonged tenure in the Forbidden Woods and the vipers that built a kinship with its residents taking a hold of their innards too. While this may seem like a handicap for most combatants, it appears they maintain their mastery over their weapons as stated in the guide, but also the secrets of the vipers described in the tales of Madaras. Our battle with these beings is truly a formidable one. It's unfortunate the gameplay itself is dull here from a difficulty standpoint, but when we equate the battle to three masters of weaponry of the Themerian race of superhumans, we can't help but see these beings as parallel to the elite human knights of contemporary times, elevated to positions of authority beside the Queen of Yharnam and the blessings of the Great Ones. With the guide explicitly telling us of their mastery, their existence as true Thumerians and their role in the world, it's not hard to consider the Shadows of Yharnam as an elite tier boss. Imagine if Bloodborne was just a book. We'd easily be able to see true Thumerians from just the law alone as beings of incredible power, and the Shadows were essentially the secret police of the Thumerian monarch, who are explicitly told to be masters of their weapons, confidently placing them here on the list. The Keeper of the Old Lords is one of, if not my most favourite enemy on this list. Much like the Smelter Demon entry from the Dark Souls 2 list, I love an entry on this list that seems so understated in the main game, but once the lore connections are made, we realise the boss is anything but ordinary. Descriptively, there are two core item descriptions that help us understand the nature of the Keeper of the Old Lords. Both the Bone Ash Mask and Armour tell us this was a being in Thumerian society that was at the utmost height of Thumerian hierarchy. They were really only second to the Surrogate Mother herself in reference to the Great Ones. While we've already learned so much about Thumerians through the previous entries of the Thumerian Descendant and Elder and even the Shadows of Yharnam, the Keeper of the Old Lords is the pinnacle of all of their strengths combined. The Bone Mask tells us a mask made of bone ash, worn by the oldest Keepers. The Keepers who mined the slumbering Great Ones gained eternal life. The long pointed hat is a symbol of the Old Keepers and is considered evidence of their companionship. While the Bone Ash armor adds, now their frail armor is white and sinewy, a window into an arcane lost art. Both infer that the Keeper of the Old Lords were the closest of the Thumerians to the Great Ones themselves. Their closeness is signified in almost a personal fashion, referred to as companionship. It's likely the Keeper of the Old Lords, before they were Keepers of Great Ones since gone, were the medium between Thumerians and Great Ones. We learn this close proximity granted them arcane arts now since lost to time. This arcane art is most definitely referencing pyromancy, the only form of magic the Keepers use and lost to the descendants ever since. We can even trace the heritage of Thumerian pyromancy, therefore to the Keepers, as the origins of arcane art of the Thumerians are never mentioned anywhere else in the game. This would mean all other Thumerians that utilise pyromancy are likely taught this skill through the Keepers, solidifying them as the most powerful practitioners of this art, evidenced in the gameplay too, as they quite effortlessly utilise pyromancy and fiery armaments in an almost Dark Souls fashion. It's on the virtue of where their position is explicitly stated to be in Thumerian hierarchy that make it in many ways the most simple Thumerian to rank on this list. And despite their lacklustre battle in the Chalice Dungeons, by law alone, they are the epitome of what made the Thumerians the superhuman race between men and gods. Although Bloodborne is a very story-driven game with many characters, one character's story in this seems to follow us from the beginning all the way to the end of the game. Ludwig, originally known as the Holy Blade, was second to the narrative of the Healing Church, only to Lawrence. While German often takes most credit for pioneering the art of the hunt, Ludwig's influence in the land of Yharnam and the Healing Church lay forever its greatest influence. The description of Ludwig's Holy Blade tells us that although German of the workshop pioneered Hunter's armaments, Ludwig would take German's blueprint and revolutionise it towards more effectively hunting beasts. 
While most of German's designs laid the foundation of hunting during a point in time where the hunters acted under the cover of night and away from the populace, the Beast Plague at this point was still an emerging threat, and even in its infancy. We learned the Plague of the Beast would persist these hunts, and as it grew to much greater proportions, the Healing Church itself organised a public official wing against the Plague of the Beasts, and at its heart was Ludwig. While Ludwig's credentials prior to this program are speculative, it's clear he was put in charge due to his already established power in the organisation. Ludwig would take on the call and create the Holy Blades. The Radiant Hunter's badge tells us these hunters, also known as Holy Blades, are what remain of an ancient line of warriors that date back to a very early age of honour and chivalry, suggesting Ludwig would not only construct the organisation, but also spearheaded it so far forward the members would become heroes of contemporary times under his influence. Ludwig and the Holy Blade's influence can be seen even during our own time in Yharnam. Various weaponry and means of battling beasts are related to Ludwig's influence. Ludwig's Holy Blade tells us the Healing Church workshop began with Ludwig and departed from old German's techniques to provide hunters with the means to hunt more terrifying beasts and perhaps things still worse. This would mean much of the Healing Church's success throughout Yharnam on nights of hunt since gone were reliant heavily on Ludwig, his holy blades, but also the influence of his art of war that other hunting factions would depend on. In this, we can infer that Ludwig not only revolutionised hunting, but also individually carried out much of the successes of the early hunt. His title, The First Hunter, is therefore not to be understood as the first human to hunt beasts, as German has a clearer timeline, but rather the best at what he did. He was the first amongst all hunters, the epitome of the hunt. We also know his victories were not only relative to the Holy Blades, but also the Thumerian Labyrinths. We can draw this parallel as the Tomb Prospector set is only available after the Sword Hunter's badge is obtained. The same badge that allows us to purchase Ludwig's Holy Blade. This not only adds further stock to Ludwig as having ventured and survived the Thumerian Labyrinths, but also suggests he may have found the Holy Moonlight Blade in these dungeons. There are countless mentions of the Moonlight Blade being linked to the Arcane and being found rather than created, and it's likely Ludwig, as one of the most capable hunters in the game, was successful in venturing deep into the tombs, dispatching all hosts of Thumerians and beasts to be granted this prized relic of the Arcane-affiliated Thumerians. The blade itself is suggested to be of incomprehensible power, linked heavily to the Great Ones and offered guidance sparingly. We learn Ludwig carried this blade through most of his tenure and was guided by the blade too, as if it had chosen him rather than the other way around. One day, however, Ludwig would mysteriously disappear. Soon enough, however, we learn he has become an aspect of the Hunter's Nightmare, a vengeful purgatory-like realm created by the Great One Kaz in response to the tragedies of the Fishing Hamlet. It's not entirely elaborated on what influence Ludwig had during the events of the Fishing Hamlet, but Carol runes associated with Ludwig would suggest that he may have been a Bergenworth member involved too with the Fishing Hamlet. This of course leads to our own formal introduction to the legendary hunter. Ludwig, much like the other hunters of the Hunter's Nightmare, has become a crude symbolism of his own life in the real world. Having mutated into a beast, the irony does not fall on deaf ears. Unlike most members of the church that would turn into beasts, it appears Ludwig's beastly form is completely different, sharing horse-like characteristics and covered in eyes. These of course could reference his gallant persona, but also his association with the Bergenworth campaign. Most notable about our face-off against him, however, is how he wields a now-enlightened Moonlight Blade. In the second phase of the fight, he relinquishes his beastly stance to an upright position, and battling us not as a beast, but as a warrior, even speaking to us in a comprehensible manner, suggesting his remaining resilience. The battle goes from being won with a great hunter turned beast, to a battle with a beast turned great hunter, and as Ludwig is emboldened by the true form of an ancient relic of the Great Ones, we are given insight into how powerful Ludwig truly was, calling forth his title as an ancient warrior from a time of chivalry. Ludwig ranks this high on the list as this battle is not just with the epitome of the hunt or the epitome of beasts, but also the epitome of all those things tied down by an aspect of the Great Ones.
As we get closer to the upper rankings of this list, you'll realise we are etching closer and closer to the elusive Great Ones themselves. Understanding the Great Ones is one of the grandest objectives in the entire game, as it does not just hold world-altering truth, but also the power to manipulate the world around you. Mikalash's story starts as many things do in Bergenworth. Though Mikalash's position or specified duties at Bergenworth are never spoken of, it's likely he departed the academic institution with Lawrence after the old blood was found deep within the Thumerian labyrinth. While the Healing Church was slowly embedding itself into Yharnam with great success, the institution began overshadowing even Bergenworth, and so the church with an abundance of resources began bureaucratizing upper echelons of the church and created sister institutions with the common goal of human evolution. Two of these notable sister institutions were the School of Mensis and the Choir. While we have spoken much about the nature of both of these in previous entries, what we need to know here is that there was a degree of cohesion between the two institutions initially, as evidenced by the Orgo Vibritus. But eventually, the School of Mensis separated from the Choir and retreated to Yahagul to continue much less ethical means of communing with the Great Ones. When we consider the Choir were responsible for using orphans as experiment fodder, we have to ask ourselves, what was Mikalash doing? But we learn quite quickly that Mikalash began a scale of operations much greater than the choir and created a shadowy group to kidnap Yarnamites, dead or alive, to experiment with in the now developing School of Mensis. We also learn the School of Mensis started to backpedal from the Healing Church too. After the success of Bergenmirth and creating Rom, Mikalash retreated from blood ministration as a core means of evolution and instead reaffirmed Master Willem's teaching, specifically around the quote, we are thinking on the basis of planes, what we need are more eyes. It's not surprising to see why Mikalash therefore required test subjects who were unwilling to forfeit themselves or their eyes to the experiments. We see Mikalash's reaffirmed dedication to the Bergenworth traditions through his garbs, with striking similarities to those we find in Bergenworth itself. Mikalash and the School of Mensis would strike many grand discoveries and are even credited with the creation of a Great One themselves in the form of the Brain of Mensis, but also striking an alliance with the Great One Amygdala and the creation of the Nightmare of Mensis. What specific rituals the institution used to manifest these successes is never alluded to, but we can see the remnants of many of the experiments throughout our walk through the school, with beings such as the One Reborn, but more specifically the Brain of Mensis, a literal brain lined with eyes. It's unclear as to what exactly caused the Nightmare of Mensis, as we do not have details about the ritual that forced it into being, but we can assume it's linked to some degree of success with communing with the Plane of Great Ones, specifically the infant Great One Murgo, or even Erden, evidenced by a battle against Murgo's wet nurse that upon defeat gives us the text Nightmare Slain, something we only see two other times in the game, but both times in reference to a being that is responsible for an alternate plane of existence, with the Moon Presence as the Hunter's Dream and the Orphan of Cars as the Hunter's Nightmare. We can assuredly put Mikalash at the heart of the successes of the School of Mensis, as he is the only named member of the institution that's spoken of, but also his position is further exemplified by the fact that we have to use his corpse to enter the nightmare, with his corpse being in the middle of the lecture hall of what is likely the final stage of the ritual that still birthed the minds of the participants. To add further credit to Mikalash's influence, we also learn that he is the only member of the school that made it through the ritual alive. This can likely be attributed to the level of insight Mikalash possessed and his ability to comprehend the nightmare without mentally imploding. It's likely Mikalash was granted this insight through his consumption of one of the three umbilical cords of Kaz retrieved by Bergenworth, and explains his vocal affinity for Kaz and even Ram, who was likely the other recipient of the umbilical cord. And when we meet Mikalash, he is referred to as the host of the nightmare. Still within his faculties, he is clearly empowered by the knowledge granted to him through the nightmare and the insight from the umbilical cord, an extremely rare occurrence in the game. This is why this battle is likely the closest we get to a human on par with the insight of Great Ones. Mikalash, empowered by the umbilical cord of Kaz, is able to utilize arcane spells better than any other human opponent, calling forth aspects of Abritus and even the extremely rare Call Beyond spell that is told to mimic the small explosion of a star sourced directly from Abritus herself. In this battle, we'd have to navigate the immensity of Mikalash's arcane knowledge, but also on a plane of existence he comprehends much better than we do, something evidenced by his ability to command skeletal puppets. 
It's for this reason Mikolash lands himself this position on the list, as not just the most proficient human user of arcane powers, but also the only human boss we get to fight that has consumed an umbilical cord of a Great One, sharing powers with what we would associate for kins of Great One, but without the vacuous and infantile penalties, and with the ambition and direction of a comprehensive and cunning human. There are a very few times a hunter on their own rises so far above their station that they command the conditions to be integral to a story about great ones, elder race of beings, and ravenous beasts. But from time to time, a hunter transcends the hunt. That is the story of Maria. The game is introduced to Maria much before the events of the DLC. We learn from German's story that an aspect of Maria has been around us and even helping us since the beginning of the game. This aspect of course is the living doll in the hunter's dream, a projection of German's unannounced love for his former student. German and Maria had of course met in person in events much before the game had begun. Both members of the Bergamoth institution, Maria a resident of Canehurst, and even the distant relative of Queen Annalise, left her birthplace and what is likely a birthright to royalty for Bergenworth. Much like German, it's not entirely clear what role Maria held before German's workshop and the discovery of the Thumerian labyrinths, but it's clear, much like German, she displayed such great strength to the institution that she was appointed as a student of German during the operations of the first hunter's workshop. The successes of the Bergamoth Tomb Prospectors are the successes of German, but also his group of hunters. Considering the Thumerian labyrinths at the time that they were discovered were covered with Loran's Beast Plague and ancient Thumerian Guardians, the original prospectors, just on their merit of surviving the expedition, were incredibly capable hunters. However, after the discovery of the Old Blood and the creation of the Healing Church Schism, Bergenworth had gotten everything they needed from the tombs, the evidence of Great Ones, and on this premise realigned their goals to search for said Great Ones. This search would of course lead to the Fishing Hamlet, the home of the now vanquished Great One Cos and her unborn fetus. The remaining hunters of the workshop would be commissioned by Bergenworth on Willem's order to raid the hamlet and retrieve whatever remnants of cars that they could find. Maria German and company would indeed do so, and this is where we truly see the efficiency of German's teaching, but also Maria's strength. The hunters would be so vicious in their campaign that they would absolutely decimate the entire region and successfully take down Kaz's infant, a true great one, a feat unheard of up to this point. Of course, meddling in the affairs of Great Ones rarely pays dividends. Maria, initially bludgeoned by the trauma of the campaign, would attempt to make amends by settling into the fishing hamlet and looking over the grounds as a protective mother, while German would continue a campaign elsewhere, something we'll go into later. So we know what Maria did and why it commands credit, but how powerful was Maria disconnected from German and her contemporary colleagues? Well, we have a few strong insights into this. The Rikuyo, Maria's primary weapon during her heyday, tells us that she wielded great dexterity, which is likely a skill developed from German, and when we consider the sheer extent to German's abilities later in the ranking, it really contextualizes Maria within the framework we can understand German's power. It's hinted many times Maria is a reflection of German's strength, and second only to German alone. This is mostly evidenced in Maria's ability to use German's hallmark skill known as quickening, the distinct power to move great distances in seconds. Quickening is something we'll go into in more detail during German's entry, but it is said to be a power that underpinned the distinct power of German and his students, and is likely attributable to their success and legacy. And the specific mention of dexterity in her weapon indicates she not only knew it, but was also a very proficient practitioner of this skill. We also learn that Maria, much like Queen Annalise, possesses an aspect of the vile blood. Vile blood, of course, is related to Canehurst. The story of Canehurst paints the picture of a civilization that stood beside Yarnum, and after the events of Bergamoth's endeavor into the Thumerian tombs, a scholar and prospector would steal vile blood from the tombs and bring it to Canehurst. The vile blood in question is likely the blood of Queen Yarnum, who is found deep within the tombs. 
If you cast your mind back to the entry of Queen Yanam on the list, we are told she was an undying being that lived through the traumatic stillbirth of Great One Murgo. Queen Yanam's blood was likely imbibed from the aspect of Erdan that had impregnated her and is responsible for her undying form. When we consider her blood being the vector in which she was granted these properties and how the administration of blood in Bloodborne is a means of adopting properties of greater beings, we learn that those that did administer vile blood would adopt an undying form. Of course, none better than the Queen of Canehurst herself is a testament to this. When we consider Lady Maria held a close heritage to the Queen of Canehurst, we can deduce that Lady Maria possesses the ability to manipulate blood, much like Queen Yarnum and Annalise, something that enhances her own swordsmanship in our battle against her. And as she stands as the final bastion against our transgressions, the fight has you navigate German's speed, Canehurst's blood, Maria's swordsmanship, and the plane of the hunter's nightmare, all together at once a truly monumental moment in the game. The next entry is our first and only look into a specific group of hunters known as the Executioners. The Executioners are given much context regarding their strength as at their height, we learn of their ability to overcome an entire kingdom. At the heart of the Executioners was Ligarius, a high-ranking member of the Healing Church. Although the founding of the Executioners is not attributable to one person, we learn that Executioners have in many ways been around since the Healing Church themselves, with Ligarius at the helm. The Healing Church was created on the back of the old blood found by the Bergenworth Tomb Prospectors, but alongside this discovery of old blood was also the vile blood, something we spoke about in our previous entry, especially in relation to Queen Yarnum, because, well, the source of this vile blood was Queen Yarnum. We learn a Bergenworth scholar likely responsible for chaining up Queen Yarnum found in the Thumerian Labyrinths, stole her Great One infused blood and carried it to Canehurst. Actions that were immediately vilified by the Bergenworth scholars, specifically those who would go on to create the Healing Church. Valblood would propel Canehurst and develop this kingdom in ways not unlike Yarnum. Yarnum, of course, now majorly governed by the powers of the Healing Church, felt disdain towards Canehurst as a bastardized version of itself predicated on tainted blood rather than the presumed holy medium that was the old blood. During this time, the executioners under the leadership of Ligarius would rally their members and seek the destruction of Canehurst and the end of the royal family. We learn Ligarius would march on Canehurst and decimate the entire kingdom, a feat that is likely to be one of the greatest in the entire game, as we learn that the kingdom of Canehurst was incredibly powerful, with a long-standing tradition of warriors and knights that told to have become such keen combatants, fighting had become more akin to art in their culture, something we see echoed even by Lady Maria in our previous entry. Although it's unclear as to how many of the executioners were present that day, or how many aside from Ligarius would make it out alive, we learn Ligarius was profoundly successful in this mission. So successful he would reach Queen Annalise of Canehurst and even slay the king of the domain, something evidenced by his choice to take the crown and utilise its power. We learn Ligarius chose against just murdering Annalise, as he understood the power of the vile blood and the perceived immortality of Erdan's influence, and therefore took it upon himself to forever look over the entrance, donning the king's crown to cast an illusion over Canehurst, forever casting it into a place of limbo, unable to exercise any more power in the world. When we meet Ligarius, it's clear he has been here for a long time. Frozen over from the climate, we learn Ligarius was able to somehow stave off death and ironically seems immortal himself. Although this is completely speculative, it's assumed much like the blood drunk hunters of Yarnum, Ligarius had slayed so many vile bloods that the vile blood itself had found its way into Ligarius' own being, granting him the immortality associated with the vile blood. Although it can be forgiven to assume our fight with Ligarius is with a being much past his prime, as the introductory cutscene shows us his slow and almost crippled movements, as we progress through the fight, Ligarius begins to take on a much more agile moveset, moving quickly and even leaping around the arena. This of course suggests it had just been a long time since Ligarius was required to act, and once adjusted, he is just as powerful as he was during his raid on Canehurst. 
When we compare Ligarius to the previous entry of Lady Maria, our strongest comparison is of course based on their most major achievements. Although a great case can be made about Lady Maria as an individual relative to German, the explicitly most capable hunter, her more objective measurements is based on her greatest act, which were her contributing success in the fishing hamlet. However, if we assert the same measurements on Ligarius, we know he was almost single-handedly able to overthrow the entire Canehurst nobility, a culture of knights and warriors that were so powerful they were known to see warfare as art and the hunt as an extension of this art. Something further elaborated on by the description of the Chicago and even the distinct nature of the popularity of Chicago-esque weaponry in the game inspired by Canehurst's notorious fighting style. And when we factor in the effects of Valblood itself on the Canehurst warriors, as discussed in Lady Maria's entry, it's clear this was no subtle feat. We don't learn of any other notable executioners during this campaign, and Alfred only alludes to one executioner being accountable for the success of this raid, that being Ligarius, now Martyr Ligarius. When comparing this to the raid on the fishing hamlet, we are told of a few notable figures and how for the most part, the raid was a completely one-sided massacre. Ligarius' actions were not only more responsible for the victory in Canehurst, but the victory itself was a much greater task than the campaign against the fishing hamlet. And as a final point, when we meet Ligarius, he is clearly enriched by the vile blood. The Executioner's Glove spell tells us Ligarius is able to use aspects of blood to call forth the vengeful spirits of Canehurst, adding another layer of complexity to the battle and further understanding of Ligarius's utter domination over the will of Canehurst. It's for this reason Martyr Ligarius ranks here on the list, a battle against what is likely the Healing Church's most executive military arm. German's history holds tragedy, loss, and unrequited love. But within the fine lines of a real human story is the picture of a hunter so powerful he never saw losses on the battlefield. We are told, much like many others, that German's story starts in Bergenworth. Although timelines, dates, and specificities are elusive, we can use some world building to fill the gaps and bring together the important notes of his story into a coherent picture. Our most prominent clue to German's history are the few ounces of personal dialogue we can listen to in The Hunter's Dream. German affectionately refers to both Lawrence and Provost Willem, suggesting Lawrence was his peer and Willem the head of the academic institution he too was a part of. Whether the German held a role similar to the scholars at Bergenworth is unclear, but what is clear is that German was always an incredibly talented warrior. So talented was he that Bergenworth likely acknowledged this strength much before some of the major events of the game. We learn that German was granted the Rune Workshop tool, an artifact that allowed the user to etch Carol runes into tools and weaponry, something fashioned from the Bergenworth scholar Carol, who was able to etch the Great One's utterings into tablets, granting them otherworldly powers. Willem's choice to grant this tool to German likely meant German, even during this time, was renowned as an incredibly capable force, and Willem sought to hone German's strength to further the college's own goals. Therefore, this is likely when the first workshop was developed, a place to train hunters in association with the Bergenworth College. But the question remains, who were they hunting? If this happened prior to the events of the Bestial Scourge and the Healing Church, what were the need for hunters? Well, it's likely at this time too, the Bergenworth College had come into discovering the Thumerian Labyrinths, unveiling the existence of a species known as the Great Ones, and understood it would be in the interest of the institution to hunt these elusive Great Ones to learn from them. We get a clue of this intention as we can find a note in Bergenworth that tells us to hunt the Great Ones. This so-called hunt first took place with the Bergenworth-affiliated tomb prospectors, hunters designed to fight off the old Thumerian labyrinths. German was a part of this expedition, and the workshop was a hub for the prospectors to train and learn to overcome the challenges within the tombs. These included Loran's bestial scourge, Thumerians, and even aspects of Great Ones themselves. 
We can therefore already start asserting the sheer power of Germen through the successes of the Bergenroth prospectors, something openly told to us through the description of Germen's burial blade. It reads, Trick weapon wielded by German, the first hunter, a masterpiece that defined the entire array of weapons crafted at the workshop. Its blade is forged with side right, said to have fallen from the heavens. This also gives us even more context as to German's capability as he's the only known hunter to successfully use the otherworldly material of Sidrite. Sidrite itself is likely a reference to meteorites, and within the game we can see Mergo's wet nurse a great one using very similar weaponry, further testament to German bearing powers extraordinary for any other hunter we meet in the game. But more important clues as to German's own strength and lasting influence can be seen through the details we have around the art of quickening, a legendary art that was founded by German that allowed extraordinary speed as detailed by the description of the old hunter bone. Through German's successful campaign, Bergenworth would stumble upon the old blood, and the institution would shun the use of this peculiar resource found in the tombs, causing the Healing Church schism and Bergenworth's reaffirmation of knowledge above all else. While members such as Lawrence would diverge from Bergenworth, Bergenworth's search for an eldritch truth continued. The tomb prospectors would officially side with the Healing Church to continue sourcing the old blood for blood ministration, but the Bergenworth scholars would move on to a much more enlightened task. This would lead to the events of the aforementioned fishing hamlet. The story of the fishing hamlet really lets us see the true extent to which German was powerful. During this expedition, we learn he was teamed up with his faithful student Maria, a member of Bergenworth with a heritage in Canehurst. We learn much of Maria's strength came from German's influence, paying homage to his otherworldly speed and dexterity, a mode of combat so efficient that Maria would comfortably relieve herself of her regional weapon of the Chicago for the Rakuyo, a weapon that honed in on the dexterity of its wielder, dexterity taught to her by German. We learn both German and Maria, alongside other members of Bergenworth, also trained by German, would absolutely decimate the fishing hamlet and even kill the infant Great One Cars, a feat we never see anywhere else in the game. For this brutality, the residents alongside their affinity for Cars would curse the hunters for their barbarism, which is a story we'll go into more detail in a later entry. But what we need to know here is that German was good at what he did. If major successes in the tombs of the old gods were not enough, or the description of the burial blade weren't enough, or even evidence of his influence and Maria's dominance in combat weren't enough, take the overwhelming success of the raid on the fishing hamlet and the destruction of a great one as further supporting evidence. When we meet German, he is trapped in the Hunter's Dream, an alternate plane of existence created by the Moon Presence. Though the story of the Hunter's Dream will be elaborated on more in the Moon Presence's entry, what we need to know here is that the Moon Presence was openly determined to become the prevailing influence in the world, and had created the Dream as a means of influencing Hunters to slay other Great Ones. And of course, who better to run the shop than the first hunter, the man who was initially tasked with chasing down great ones, German. The Moon Presence's choice to have German run the workshop is further proof that even one of the greatest beings in the universe saw German as the perfect figure for his goals, testament to his power. And right at the end of the game, with the Moon Presence looming over German, we are given the choice to battle the old hunter. Equipped with his legendary burial blade and still maintaining most of his combat capabilities, likely enriched by the Moon Presence's influence, we are not only up against the first hunter, the inventor of trick weaponry, the father of quickening, but also the master of the craft, leveraged by the single most influential great one in the entire game. It's fitting German corners off the human aspect of this list, as this is where a major shift takes place as we are now entering the realm of great ones. The story of the orphan is in many ways the story of the fishing hamlet, 
As already discussed, the fishing hamlet in Bloodborne was a place that drew the attention of the Bergenroth scholars much before the events of the main game. While Willem was coming to the understanding of the presence of Great Ones from the Thumerian Labyrinths, he developed the hypothesis of sourcing the power of Great Ones from their physiology in our own world. In time, he would hear murmurs of a community of fishers who had been worshipping an otherworldly being that had washed up upon their shores. Willem would task his most capable members such as Maria to enter the hamlet and learn more about this entity. The hunters would indeed do so, but also implement very forceful measures. Experimenting and torturing many of the residents, the final act would be the extraction of the orphan of Kaz, who was an infant Great One still attached to the dead Great One Kaz that had indeed washed up ashore the fishing hamlet. It's these actions that would then lead to Willem's discovery of eyes, cosmos, and the umbilical cords. But if the orphan was taken away and dissected, as we later come to learn, how do we go face to face with the orphan of cars in the game as a boss battle? We learn that the actions of the Bergenworth hunters were so gruesome that the residents influenced by Kaz itself would curse their transgressors with what is later known as the Hunter's Nightmare, a realm of purgatory where the perpetrators were condemned to live and hunt for eternity. It's well speculated that the source of this nightmare is due to the lasting powers of Kaz on the realm, and the source of this is tied closely to the orphan of Kaz. This is a great time to reassert that Great Ones, even if their physical form is defeated, likely still exist in a plane beyond human comprehension, therefore untethered to what we perceive as physical components. In this, it's not surprising to learn that at the heart of the Hunter's Nightmare is the Orphan of Cars, detached from its mother using the placenta as a weapon. In understanding how powerful the Orphan of Cars is, it's important to first look at its qualifying factors as a great one. We will learn in the next entries too that there are a few instances where we can assuredly call something a great one. And the term great one is not just a single position of power, but a gradient in which things have ascended normal human comprehension. Therefore, not all great ones are equal, but all great ones are great due to their inequality to humans. With that being said, what is the Orphan of Cars? We can confidently assume the Orphan of Cars is indeed a Great One, as we can see that it was birthed directly from the now deceased Great One Cars, an explicitly mentioned Great One, and even is still attached to aspects of Cars in both our battle with it and our first introductory cutscene. There is also a very compelling theory that the Orphan of Cars is not just the would-be child of a Great One, but an aspect of Cars itself, manifested in a raging spirit to avenge the desecration of the unborn child, similar to another entry we'll be looking at in the form of Murgo's wet nurse and Erden. But this aspect of Cars is still lesser than the actual Great One Cars. The Orphan of Cars, despite his gameplay being one of the hardest bosses in the entire game, is our righteous introduction to the Great Ones on this list. As being so powerful, they steered the nature of the world and created a plane so potent, even the greatest hunters would become eternal victims to its wrath in the Hunter's Nightmare. The reason the Orphan ranks as the lowest true Great One is a combination of how Kaz itself was, for one reason or the other, unable to sustain itself on Earth in a similar fashion to the other Great Ones such as the Moon Presence and Abritus, but also how our encounter isn't with the fully-fledged Great One Kaz, but its unborn child who harbours aspects of the Mother's vengeance. While these drawbacks are best seen in its appearance, be not mistaken, as we are now in the realm of Great Ones. The power of the Orphan and its incomprehensibly high insight allow it to manipulate lightning and battle us in a way that no ordinary hunter should be able to comprehend, let alone stand toe to toe against. From the aspect of a deceased Great One to the influence of a Great One alive, our next entry is Amygdala. In Bloodborne, you will quickly learn that no matter how far the Eldritch Truth appears to be, the harbingers of that truth, aka the Great Ones, are always incredibly close to you. One of the most prominent, albeit 
benign Great Ones is Amygdala. Amygdala's presence can actually be seen from the very beginning of the game. If the player has a certain amount of insight, Amygdala, or what has been described as Lesser Amygdala, can be seen throughout the game stalking the hunter. The nature of Amygdala's agents is one of the most contentious points of law in the entire game. While beings like Rom are explicitly told to be kin of Great Ones, therefore not a Great One, and beings such as Abritus indicated to be a Great One left behind by her own species, Amygdala and subsequently the Lesser Amygdala are a much more confusing situation. We can, with some degree of certainty, assume a being named Amygdala, be it its name or a species, are directly referred to as Great Ones. The weapon known as the Amygdalan Arm confirms this in its description. But we see a variety of beings that share Amygdalan characteristics, from beings clutched to buildings throughout the game, to the boss we actually fight in the Nightmare Frontier. From this, we can assume the Amygdala scattered throughout the world are more so extensions of a great one labelled Amygdala, extensions of a much greater being that is operating at a higher plane. In many ways, these Amygdala are its eyes on the world and means of exerting influence. This, of course, is seen best at the School of Mensis, where Amygdala is venerated to the point of worship by the Mensis Institution. In our previous entry with the Orphan of Kars and Rom, we learned that ranking the power of Great Ones is probably the most difficult task in this entire video. But it's not impossible. We learned the term Great One is a gradient. The progression of how great a Great One is, is in a lot of ways linked to the tangible concept of the insight they have and the measurement of this through how developed they are in more complex planes of existence. For example, Erden, a being we never get to battle, is considered so ascended he has become something akin to an Abrahamic god, omnipotent and omniscient. Whereas Rom, who is an almost great one, is still physically present but thinks and influences the realms of much greater great ones such as the Moon Presence. So where does the Amygdala we battle in the Nightmare Frontier land on this list? As a hotly debated topic, I do believe the Amygdala in the Nightmare Frontier is the closest physical manifestation of Amygdala the Great One, but I don't believe it is Amygdala the Great One. If we consider the lesser Amygdala around the world we see as extensions of a much greater being, it's hard to suggest the Amygdala boss battle is the Great One, as they still persist in the world even after we have defeated it. In this, I think the Amygdala we do battle is something more akin to its metaphorical arm, the main source of power it uses to hold influence in lower planes, and even the place where it's able to take on sacrifices, as described by patches in the game. So even though in many ways the Amygdala we fight in the Nightmare Frontier is a battle with a Great One, it's not a battle with the Great One Amygdala. It's a battle with the power of Amygdala, but in a lower plane of existence that we can actually comprehend. In my opinion, Amygdala the Great One is closer to what we understand is Erdin, a formless omnipresent being that is still concerned with the actions of lower realms, whereas Erdin is less concerned due to how far it has ascended. Amygdala still seems attentive to humanity. It's like asking us humans in the real world to care for the life of ants, but as ants are so far detached from our understanding in the world, they are simply too plain to find satisfaction in meddling with their affairs. Amygdala is more like a bird in this analogy, still finding sustenance in meddling in the life of ants, whereas humans are more akin to Erden in this analogy, completely disconnected from the life of ants outside of more grand objectives that may or may not involve ant life. The extension of Amygdala we fight in the Nightmare Frontier utilises beams of energy and a complex and coherent eldritch design, and we can assume it is one of the most powerful beings in the entire game, but less powerful than whole Great Ones who are outright present in the world, such as the Moon Presence and Abritus. It's for this reason Amygdala ranks here on the list, above the Orphan of Kaz, as Amygdala, the Great One at the point we meet him, is still at his zenith of influence in the world and seems much further up the gradient of Great Ones than Kaz. The one projection of Kaz in the form of the Orphan is an unstable and vengeful infant born from a Great One who died in the natural world due to being unable to sustain itself 
whereas amygdala is far more resilient, omnipresent, and its influence much more tangible in the world. Amygdala is cunning and calculated, and unlike Kaz, is not a victim of humanity, but a puppeteer finding joy as it manipulates humans for no reason but to meddle meaning our physical encounter with amygdala's physical manifestation is a much more potent experience of a great one on Earth. The third great one on this list is Murgo's Wet Nurse. Immediately this listing might rear many Bloodborne fans' heads as Murgo's Wet Nurse's credentials are not easy to ascertain and this makes making the case for Murgo's Wet Nurse as one of the greatest great ones in the game a challenge to begin with. So what I will do is break down a few things to catch you all up to speed with where I am in this ranking. Murgo's Wet Nurse is the being found at the crib of the infant child of the Great One only known as Murgo. Murgo's heritage can be traced back to two beings, both of monumental esteem in their respective categories. We've learned that the namesake of the location we play the majority of the game in is named after Queen Yarnum. Yarnum herself was a Thumerian monarch selected to host the child of the most elusive but consequentially most powerful Great One in the entire game. Erden. If we harken back to the other rankings, we learn that Great Ones are not all equal in strength, and on the gradient of strength for Great Ones, we learn that those that are the furthest ascended from the base plane of the game command the highest level of insight and therefore power in knowledge, which is the determining factor as to the power of a Great One and the material condition that predicates Great Ones as greater than all other forms of life. Erden, the father of Murgo, is only referred to in certain parts of the game. We learn Erden is a completely formless Great One that does not hold any physical form in the base plane of the game. So powerful is he, his omnipresence isn't held through proxies such as Amygdala with his Amygdalae, instead his presence is permanently transfixed everywhere in the game, his voice being the only traces of evidence we can assert to even his existence in the game. If in any form we are asked to battle Erden in his physical form, we would likely only be able to comprehend this form if we ourselves could ascend to Erden's own plane, something that is nearly impossible for even other great ones. But if we did happen to have this opportunity, it would be an impossible challenge as Erden's existence as an almost Abrahamic entity would be incomprehensibly powerful for any hunter. But Murgo's wet nurse is not Erden, nor is it even Murgo itself, so why have I just outlined the above? Well, it's likely, much like Amygdala and the Orphan of Cars, that Murgo's wet nurse is, in fact, in a similar fashion, the aspect of Erden on our plane dutied with preserving the life of its child, Murgo. While the Orphan of Cars is the medium in which Cars projects itself on our plane to punish hunters that mutilated its child, in the same fashion, Murgo's wet nurse is the aspect of Erden commanded to look over his child, likely as a means to stop hunters, most specifically the Bergenworth-affiliated School of Mensis hunters, from desecrating Murgo. There are two diverging conclusions we can gather from this then. The first is that Erden, the formless Great One, projected some aspect of itself to look over its child in the absence of its mother, therefore relating the being to a wet nurse. Or the alternative, that Murgo itself projected the wet nurse as a self-created means of preservation. Regardless of which is true, both would indicate Erden, the single most powerful being mentioned in Bloodborne, is behind the power of the wet nurse. Further evidence for this theory can be found when we look at the way in which Murgo's wet nurse actually fights us. It uses abilities that allow it to become formless, teleport with impunity, and even duplicate itself out of what seems to be thin air, something we can correlate to the formless properties of Erden, and the likely inherited properties Murgo would have gained from Erden's lineage. But if Murgo's wet nurse is a projection of the greatest being in the entire game, why does it not hold the number one position? For this, there is only one single explanation. Unlike our next two entries, Murgo's wet nurse, much like Cos and Amygdala before it, are just projections of a Great One. It's not their physical being associated directly with the Great One in question. In this, the last two entries are the only two times in the game we are granted an audience with a true Great One, leading us perfectly 
to our next entry. From aspects to material, the story of Abritus is also one of the main anchors of the game's entire narrative. Abritus is introduced to us as two things, the daughter of the cosmos, but more importantly, the left behind great one. Considering the latter as issued in a singular tense, this is one of a few occasions in the game we are directly told the status of a Great One as a Great One. Abritus was initially discovered by the Tomb Prospectors associated with Bergenworth and the Healing Church as they ventured through the newly discovered Thumerian Labyrinth. Eventually they would stumble upon an unusual resource known as the Old Blood. Although there is debate as to where the old blood came from initially, what is incredibly likely is that the healing church at the height of its power actually sourced a large pool of this blood from Abritus. We even learn Abritus had closely allied itself with the healing church due to its dealings with the healing church's choir, a high ranking sect of the healing church devoted to reaching out to the cosmos through Abritus, something Abritus may have seen as a means to return to the plane of her own kind. In this alliance, it isn't hard to assume the healing church were allowed to bleed the great one as a reward for their continued cooperation. In our encounter with Abritus, the Great One is completely non-hostile to the player, further asserting the position that Abritus must have drawn a tolerance to humanity on the basis of the previously mentioned alliance. To anchor this point, Gilbert tells us deep within the Cathedral Ward is the Old Grand Cathedral, the birthplace of the Healing Church's special blood, further alluding to the idea that whatever is below the Grand Cathedral is the source of the Old Blood, which is exactly where we find Abritus. All of this, of course, gives us the assurance that Abritus is indeed a fully developed Great One. We can even witness the extent to which Abritus is cosmically above most other beings in the game, as many enlightened individuals of high insight such as Mikalash utilise the auger of Abritus in their arsenal as a means to flex their intellectual ascension, adding credit to the idea that even the most insightful enemies call upon aspects of Abritus in their fights. This is not the only aspect of Abritus utilised by those of Insight either. There are stark correlations that a majority of arcane spells are sourced from Abritus, such as the empty phantasm shell indicated to be a familiar of Abritus, and even the incredibly powerful A Call Beyond, a spell directly associated with Abritus developed by the choir. A Call Beyond is said to be so powerful that it resembled a small exploding star. With this being said, we now know three things. Abritus is a fully developed Great One, Abritus is fully materially present in our plane of existence, and finally, Abritus is such a cosmically powerful being that entire schools of offensive spellcasting have been developed around just the small projections of this Great One. The description of A Call Beyond reaffirms this by stating the rite failed to achieve its intended purpose, but instead created a small exploding star, now a powerful part of the choir's arsenal. We even learn that the choir were the greatest minds of the healing church, adding further credit to Abritus's power. When we finally get to go face to face with Abritus with the above being said, it's likely a battle of cosmic proportion. We are fighting for the first time a great one in all of its totality. Here Abritus is utilising all of her cosmic power. Power that is not just an aspect summoned by an insightful scholar, but the purest source of the power itself. But why does Abritus come second then? If Abritus is a great one who is so powerful that its existence pioneered an entire school of cosmic warfare, why is she not number one? Well, there is one caveat with Abritus that reduces her down. As a great one, Abritus seems much weaker than the direct power of other great ones. As unlike beings such as Kars, Erden, or even Amygdala, Abritus seems to have lost the ability to communicate with the planes beyond, specifically the plane of her own kind, the cosmos. 
Once Abritus was suddenly abandoned by her Great One peers, she has been looking to rejoin them since that very day, and is even the reason Abritus had relied on the ambition of humanity to help her reach those planes through the choir, orphanage, and even the Celestial Emissary. In this, we learn that Abritus, though one of the two occasions we actually meet a Great One in the game, is still one of the weakest Great Ones in the entire game, as Great Ones are often measured in ranking by their insight, as previously mentioned, and Abritus's lack of insight can be attributed to her inability to ascend to the greater planes and even the cosmos itself. Regardless, this still puts her above the projections of much greater Great Ones as she is still a Great One who is fully present in the world at the time that we meet her. A presence that had become the cornerstone of arcane warfare in the game, testament to the power of what we should expect from a truly present Great One, but also testament to the power of Abritus herself. This of course leads to our final entry, something that encapsulates everything strong about Abritus and the Great Ones that transcend all planes of existence within human comprehension. The story of the Moon Presence signifies the Truman Show moment of the game. Upon Rom's death, the world unplagued by Rom's illusory bulwark is finally revealed to us. We find out that the scourge of the beast is not the be-all threat to Yarnum. Instead, just a mechanism of a much greater influence. We learn the Scourge of the Beast, though linked closely with the ministration of the Old Blood, spearheaded by Lawrence's Healing Church, is also greatly affected by the existence of another entity, the Blood Moon. Though the Old Blood alone has been shown in the past to be enough to trigger the Scourge of the Beast so powerful it had the ability to topple an entire prevailing order, as was the case for Loran, we also learn the Blood Moon, and therefore the Moon Presence, who is told to be the embodiment of that Moon, is also related to the acceleration of the Beastly Scourge, suggesting the Moon Presence commands a sphere of influence much greater than Abritus. We learn the Moon Presence is both physically present in the accessible planes, but also has the ability to manipulate higher planes of existence. The Moon Presence was first beckoned by Lawrence for reasons unknown, but likely affiliated with evolution via the Old Blood. But in a twist of fate, not unlike a deal with the Devil, evolution was gifted, just not the kind Lawrence had envisaged, as it only further accelerated the beastly scourge. The Moon Presence, once introduced to the plane, also grew ambitions of its own. The Moon Presence was cunning and powerful enough to use hunters as a means to its own ends. It's not surprising, therefore, to find the Moon Presence would create a plane of existence for capable hunters as a hub, but also a lifeline to continue their mission to chase and kill other Great Ones in the world, so it could further its own influence in the world uncontested. It's the reason the Hunter's Dream is burning after the death of Murgo's wet nurse, indicating it was Erdan's influence the Moon Presence sought to destroy, and once accomplished, our duties were no longer needed. This plane of existence would be called the Hunter's Dream. As already discussed in German's entry on this list, it's unclear how or when the Hunter's Dream was constructed, but it's likely affiliated with a pact Lawrence had come to with the Moon Presence once beckoned. And as German would be renowned for having already developed a command over hunting and the creation of hunter utilities during his time as a hunter and the head of the Old Hunter's Workshop, the Moon Presence would prey on Ger German's grief regarding Lady Maria's absence after the events of the fishing hamlet, and German having gone through a spout of unrequited love and longing, would accept a deal with the Moon Presence in bringing to life a doll reminiscent of Maria, but inadvertently trapping German to the hunter's dream forever as a guide to the other hunters under the Moon Presence's influence. Through these events, it's clear the Moon Presence was not just an ordinary Great One, but one that held immense power, comparable or even superseding of that of Koz and Koz's construction of the Hunter's Nightmare. 
However, unlike Koz, it appears the moon presence was also able to sustain itself within the ordinary plane of existence and also influence the actions and conditions of humanity with relative ease. So well was the moon presence's plans, the Great One held confidence too in its ability to topple even other Great Ones with influence in the world. We are also given more context as to the immensity of the Moon Presence's power when we consider how powerful German was at the time the Moon Presence was able to trap him in the Hunter's Dream, but also how powerful we the player have to be to escape the same fate in the B ending of the game. If the player has not consumed at least three parts of the umbilical cord, the Moon Presence, regardless of the player's intentions, will trap us in the exact same fate as German, canonizing the Moon Presence's power as significantly stronger than any hunter, even a hunter that would have had to defeat various aspects of Great Ones to even get to this point of the game. We learn we can avert the Moon Presence's influence if we consume at least three parts of the umbilical cord, as umbilical cords are closely affiliated with transferring the insight of Great Ones onto ourselves. We can understand that there is a base level of insight we require to even comprehend a battle against the Moon Presence, a feature that is not present with our fight with any other Great One, including the physically present Abritus. Think about that for a second. The Moon Presence is such an immense battle that we can't even begin to comprehend a fight against him until we have gathered the significant insight of another Great One. We also learn the Moon Presence holds something that allows our character to take the form of a Great One itself. Upon ending C, where we have consumed the umbilical cords and defeated the Moon Presence, we take on the form of an infant Great One, suggesting the Moon Presence alongside the insight of consuming umbilical cords held a secret the entire game was predicated on discovering, Eldritch Ascension. It's for these reasons the Moon Presence, the Great One determined to puppeteer the nature of the world, lands the highest position on this list. Willem once said, we are undone by the blood, and the Moon Presence is synonymous with this undoing. It's the Great One that best encapsulates the ambitions of the Healing Church Schism and underpins the consequences of humanity seeking salvation from the presumed benevolence of greater beings, only to realise these greater beings were reflections of ourselves, using the greed and ambitions of humanity as a means to their own end. It's fitting at the end of the world, once we've defeated the Moon Presence, we as humans become a Great One ourselves. Thanks again for making it to the end of yet another long video. This video is somewhat longer than the last ones as trying to fit the entire story of Bloodborne in one video is a task in itself. I want to once again give a massive shout out to Last Protagonist for helping me contextualize the world of Bloodborne. His channel is a great resource in understanding Bloodborne and I highly recommend checking his stuff out. His channel is in the description. Next up is the Elden Ring video. Although I've been doing much work on this video, I'm still waiting for the Elden Ring DLC to drop before I finalize everything so that I have a much more conclusive and inclusive ranking in one video. Before then, I've been working on ranking Sekiro and maybe even other aspects of the Soulsborne universe by lore, like NPCs and regular enemies. Which would you like to see the most? Please let me know as your input drives the trajectory of my channel. Thanks again, and I'll see you guys soon.